Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome to a special edition of the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. We're coming back at you with a UCF Rewind looking at the 2017 American Athletic Conference Football Championship when UCF defeated Memphis 62-55 to in overtime to uh, secure the American Championship and go to uh, the Peach Bowl. My name is Jeff Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Alongside me, my usual partners in crime, Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy, and joining us, a special guest who figured mightily in this unbelievable game, over 110 points, 1,300 yards of total offense. Uh, and, of course, in a game that was like that, of course, he had the most important defensive play at the end of the game. Uh, eight tackles and probably the most important interception in UCF history. Trey Neal is here with us. What's up, Trey? Nothing much, man. How you guys doing? Good, man. We're so First of all, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're super busy right now. And uh, but you're taking some time out for us to talk about this just incredible moment, not just in your career, but in UCF history. And um, and uh, well, first of all, before we get started, um, just if you can just catch up everyone here in UCF land about what you're up to now. Obviously, we remember you, you know, you left UCF after 2017, um, transferred over to Nebraska, uh, played one year there and then uh, and then graduated. So what are you up to now? Yeah, uh, now I work up in the hospital up here in uh, Gainesville, Georgia. It's called uh, Northeast Georgia. Uh, I work in with surgery, so I help, you know, help doctors, you know, move some legs, move some arms, you know, get them some medicine, blood, stuff like that. So I help doctors, uh, PAs, uh, anesthesiologists, assistants, and stuff like that. So I just help them out in surgeries, whatever they need. Um, I kind of just their right hand a little bit, so. And just a whole bunch of surgeries every day, so you see a lot of a lot of crazy things in the operating room. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm believe it or not, I, I'm actually pretty familiar with that with Northeast Georgia Medical up in uh, up in Gainesville because I actually used to cover high school football in that area. Now you went to mm-hmm. Buford, right? Yes, sir. Buford High School. Right. So the running joke every year was uh, there was always two questions we would always ask is. Um, is who's who are the favorites to win the state championship and number two uh is it not buford (laughs) because buford is like the new england patriots of of georgia high school football is how just to give everybody just a real quick idea of how good a program you came out of how good is buford at football well, so I played four years of high school, and I lost three total games that I was actually playing in four years. I went to four state championships, and one of those losses was in the state, and that was my sophomore year, which was arguably probably the best team that we've ever put out there as far as recruit-wise and, uh, you know, just having a lot of kind of players. And now you're back, and now you're back home uh, working in yep. Northeast Georgia. And I, by the way, on behalf of all of us, can't thank you enough for the – work that you're doing we know we were trying to put this together but you've been so busy at work and i know with uh with COVID 19 and everything that it's uh that it's a tough it's it's a tough time out there so um but you know the three of us you know and on behalf of everyone down here who loves you down here at ucf you know thank you so much for what you're doing for the folks up there because uh it's it's immeasurable the good that you're doing yes sir no problem i appreciate it yeah. i'm just doing my job every day I hear you. Well, let's get your mind off your job for a little bit. All right. So um, let, we're, ta- we're talking about the uh, I, w- I want to let Elo kind of and, and Murph kind of take the lead here because we're talking about this 
um, this wild game between UCF and Memphis back in the, but it, let's, I just want to set the scene first because this was the second time that you guys had played Memphis. Obviously this was yep. one week and a day after the, th- that emotional thriller against USF. <laughs> yeah. And, and we'll start with like the week leading up to the game. There's so much going on. The rumors about Scott Frost going to Nebraska, the, uh, the um, the emotional coming down off the emotional high of that game on Black Friday and the pressure of knowing that, you know, if you guys slipped up in this game, everything that you work for an undefeated regular season kind of goes out the window and you're playing a team that you that you guys walloped earlier in the year, but they were mm-hmm. severely shorthanded in the regular season matchup. This was a much different Memphis team than you were playing um, the first time, I think the final score is 40 to 13 in that one. So give us, uh, after this question, I want to turn it over to Eric and, and Murph, but just give us the lay of the land in the locker room and what you were thinking about in the week leading up to this game. Oh, well, you know, that week was a long week. Uh, you know, we watched a lot of that tape from the first game, uh, just because we knew what, you know, we knew what kind of potential they had offensively. Uh, the first game, we, you know, we dominated them. I mean, they, they know that, we know that. But there was a lot of tendencies that we had picked up on the first time, which helped us a lot. But uh, I remember one of our coaches said, the quarterback told me after that game, good, good job, coach. We'll see you guys in the championship. So he told us that uh, <laughs> probably about two or three weeks after. I was like, let me, let me watch these guys a little bit more. So every Saturday, whenever, you know, whenever they were playing – I would try to watch at least a quarter and a half. Me and Kyle Gibson would try to watch at least just, you know, see if they change anything, if they were trying to try anything new after that game. And, I mean, they they were testing out a lot of different things. But I think that just, you know, that goes to show you, you know, the coaching staff they had. They were they were real confident in their players, and they were just, you know, seeing how to get their, you know, their playmakers the ball. I mean, a lot of those guys are in the NFL now, so that offensive team. But uh, I know during that week was the – the peak of rumor um, as far as Coach Frost leaving. Uh, I know that. So initially we have we had like a unity council, which was a couple of leagues, uh, probably about eight or ten of us that were voted upon each position. And we had a meeting, and this was probably after the ECU game. And we, that's when we first started hearing things about, you know, Coach Frost might be leaving. We didn't know exactly where or to who or anything, but people were hearing it. And we had a meeting about it just like, you know, play football. And that's kind of when we kind of knew, like, okay, this is for real. Our coach might, you know, he might be gone after the year, <laughs> um, you know, because we're mm-hmm. playing so well. And, you know, Coach Frost, is a, he was a big name at the time. You know, we had the number one offense in the country. So that's all teams are looking for. So those rumors started cranking up a little bit. Uh they were cranking up a lot actually that week. So we just kind of, you know, met with the players and just was like, look, man, we have a championship online and undefeated season. You know, we haven't never done this, you know, in the school history. So, you know, let's try to focus on that. And, you know, I think that was that was enough to get those guys, uh, you know, motivated at that time to just, you know, be undefeated and go play in the, you know, big January, New Year's Eve Bowl or New Year's Day Bowl game. Yeah. Trey, I'll, I'll start. And, and, uh, I think the the two things I want to ask most about stuff before the game was how hard was it, even though you had an extra day to prepare because the Black Friday game was the Friday and then you had Saturday for the championship game, how hard was it to come and refocus yourselves after such an emotional roller coaster like that USF game and put your focus on the Memphis game? How much time did you need to do that? And then going into the Memphis game, did you feel or did, was there a sense of pressure around the team? Because you guys knew that uh, no matter what you had already accomplished, which was already a lot and a lot more than anybody expected, no matter what you guys had already accomplished, if you lost this one game, you, you don't go to the Peach Bowl. You end up at the Liberty Bowl and likely face a 7-5 and five Iowa State team. Yeah. Um, so, so what was the, So I guess my two questions are, what was it like coming off the USF game? And then what was the pressure? Was there any feeling of pressure before the Memphis game? Oh, uh, I mean, I don't ever think – I think – I mean, we knew there was pressure. I mean, you could tell there was pressure rising, and, you know, we had something going just from, uh, you know, all the outcry for our ranking and the uh, college football playoff with our record and stuff like that. And, I mean, even things that we used to notice was from the first game 
until that USF game, until that Memphis game, just how many people were coming to our game. I mean, you know, we're, we're from, you know, 0-12 team and then 6-6. and six, So the stadium was never super full. There were always spots that, you know, you could see. But, I mean, sure. each week you start seeing it fill up and then fill up more. And then people are coming in early to watch us warm up. And you're like, the stadium's filled up, you know, and us in warm up. So that's how early people are getting there. So we kind of had that kind of sense of, like, urgency. Like, okay, you know, we're the show in town. You know, we've always known that, you know, even though we're athletes, we're entertainers too. So uh, mm-hmm. we do that, uh, you know, just we got to put on a show for these guys, man. So that was kind of – it was kind of a good kind of pressure. You know, like, we have all these people here on a Saturday. You know, we're going to be the only games on. You know, this is just – this is conference, this is championship week. You know, there's only a select few of conference championship games that are actually played. So we know that everybody's going to be watching that TV. Everybody's going to be packed here, you know, stuff like that. So we just wanted to put on on the show. I'm sure you did. Uh, it was a noon <laughs> t- a kickoff. And, you know, and it was interesting because the broadcast, I rewatched the game recently, mm-hmm. and they mentioned the fact, I mean, you were supposed to play Memphis on September 8th. That got yep. pushed to September 30th because of Hurricane Irma yep. in that situation. Uh, so they talked about in the broadcast, like, in theory, this was like the third time you guys were preparing for Memphis. Yeah. Uh, just, exactly. you know, and t- take us through that because you guys, because of Hurricane Irma, basically played uh, without a bye week the rest of the year. I think, what, 11 yeah. straight weeks going into yeah. that game? Yeah. Yep. Uh, that was uh, that was tough. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, we thought that, you know, we don't have – we get our bye week now. But I know a lot of the coaches were worried because of how draining that is. Uh, and it was, man, especially, you know, when you're playing with that target on your back, you're getting the best shot from everybody. Uh, I remember – I think it was after the Navy game. I mean, that was a physical game just because, uh, you know, they're running triple option. I knew that guys were – that was one where we came out practice Monday and we're like, Coach, we're, we're banged up, man. It's, we were so – I mean, guys were – you know, a whole bunch of bump bruises, you know, hammies uh, just from, you know, that physicality and then keep on going week after week after week, and, you know. So a lot of our – turned into, you know, a lot – we became a more of a mental team at that point. Uh, and, you know, that's that's just credit to, you know, the coaches and, you know, the leaders. Uh, just being able to keep – we had a lot of young guys that were playing. Just being able to keep them focused and, you know, keep the guys on scout team focused and stuff like that. Just, you know, I give credit to, you know, all the leaders of the team for that just because how physically draining it was and, you know, just after that. I know SMU, you know, getting, getting those kind of teams best shot, Every week, I mean, they're putting out the perfect game plan to beat everything we're doing. And then they're putting out the perfect defensive game plan just to beat, you know, just to beat us. So, you know, just going out there and, you know, playing those teams, that was the hardest part of the having everything rescheduled because of the hurricane. It was the bye week. That was the underlying factor, especially in our uh, defensively, uh, you know, how we started slipping up a little bit towards, you know, the last few three or four weeks of the season. You know, guys are just, we're, we're, we're tired really tired and we're banged up and stuff yeah yeah it was what it was what 11 11 straight games and not to mention the fact that you guys are also out on the field for a lot of those games because the exactly. the 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 scheme that you know you guys played obviously it had to be bend but don't break because you know the offense is the offense's job is to just keep the pace up and score points there, there, there's yeah. there's not a ball control offense so you guys are out there on the field a lot right yeah, a lot i mean you're talking about you know coach frost this is this is an oregon type offense these guys are going a yeah. hundred thousand miles an hour you know <laughs> so i mean there was times where we would play a hundred snaps of defense a game you know and a lot of us were playing most of those snaps so i mean you know and then you go and look at, like, for example, when we were in, I was in Nebraska, we're playing the Iowa team. We're playing 45, 50 snaps a game just because the type of tempo they can control on offense with just running the ball. You know, those are to- two totally different types. You know, you're doing that over 10, 11-game season. That's a lot of snaps. And then, you know, a lot of our guys are playing special teams and stuff. That's just a lot of snaps, you know, on your body. You know, just – and you don't even have to get hit every play, but just, you know – exerting that kind of energy each and every play each and every game you know that stuff starts to take a toll on you that's why you know having that bye week earlier or in the middle of the year like it was planned would have been a lot better just to have a week to kind of decompress you know get these nicks and bumps and bruises fixed up and you know ice bath and stuff like that that was you know that was key but you know that 11 game 
stretch, I believe, you know, it was rough. So I'm not going to lie. It yeah. was rough. Yeah, yeah, Trey, it's interesting you bring that up. So you mentioned the Navy game, and obviously, uh, like, there was that game was in the balance for most of the game. Yeah. It, the, the week after that game was the Austin P game. And that was like the first. That was like the first game for the the media, us reporters, because you guys give up 33 points, and we're like, "What? What's happening to the defense? Yep. Well, That's, 33 yep. points, to Austin P. What's happening? What's going on?" And you know, you saw from there that the defense wasn't as strict and as as resistant as it used to be. And obviously, you give a lot of points to USF and Memphis yep. at the time. You know, you and your teammates are fielding all these questions about. What's wrong with the defense? What's wrong with the past defense? It used to be, you should be, be better. What, what's wrong with it? And you guys gave all the right answers about, you know, your opponents are good, are good, are good. Uh, you're, you're facing good teams, you're good offenses. You guys are trying your best. Sometimes it's just a mistake. But could you just say simply that all of those sort of, sort of backslide was just due to pure exhaustion? Yeah, and I mean, you know, at the time, you know, we're not going to say, oh, yeah, we're exhausted because, you know, offensive teams are just going to be like, all right, let's crank this tempo up even more. <laughs> you know, right. we're just going to, uh, you know, we're, we're, we understood that, you know, we're tired of – that's not really an excuse, but, mm-hmm. you know, looking back, you know, two, three years later, we're just like, look, man, that's just the reality <laughs> of what was going on. We were the, one of the yeah. only teams week straight. You know, there's a reason teams don't play 11 weeks straight in any, you know, any kind of football setting. You know, everybody has a bye – sometime in the middle just because of that kind of exhaustion that you go through and you know that navy game is what i I tell everybody that that navy game was the point where that one wore us down physically just because of the type of football you're playing it's not just open field Mm -hmm. space you know just bring guys down i mean you're talking about you're hitting somebody every play you're getting cut every play somebody's getting cut you know just that's the kind of physicality that game was so you know and that one takes a toll i mean imagine somebody just Taking you from the bottom of your legs every single play, yeah. you're falling off your body, boom! You got to get up, and then next play, same thing, boom! I mean, especially those big guys up front, man. They, I mean, we had them outweighed by 70, 80 pounds, some of them, and so they can't block. You know, they can't block Tristan Hill. They can't block Jeremiah Pittman by themselves, and you know, Tony. Got to, you know, they got to cut them. So those guys, you know, they're just getting their knees walloped every single play. That stuff takes a toll. And, you know, I think that was, you know, I tell everybody that was the, the turning point physically. Uh, mentally, we were always sharp. But that Austin P game, we came out sluggish. And, and we could feel it. They're like, what's going on with you guys? We're like, coach, we're hurting, man. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, luckily we had, again, the number one offense in the country. Those guys can put up points in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, really, we never really were stressed on defense. But we, we knew, all right, we got to start. You know, we got to take care of our bodies and go the extra mile. And I know Coach Duval and uh, the way coaches and Miss Mary and all of them, they they met, after that game, they started making up uh, a, a really good plan to help us recover, you know, just with going week to week so much. It really was. And by the way, it wouldn't get easier on this uh, championship day. I mean, they were typing it up on the broadcast, the top two scoring offenses in college football going into that week. Uh, UCF was averaging 48 points a game. Memphis was averaging 47. And – Memphis set the tone early because they won the toss and said, no, we're not going to defer. We're going to take the ball right away. Everybody wants the yeah. ball in this game. And you kind of made a key, key play or in the second play of the game. Because mm-hmm. the thing I noticed in re-watching the game is uh, you had a lot of dealings with Daryl Henderson. Memphis yeah. just saw running back. Uh, yeah. You won some battles, and I'll be honest, you didn't win some battles. Then again, not oh, a lot yeah. of people won a lot of battles against Daryl Henderson, as we would find out for the next two years, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but you tackled him. He threw a screen pass to him, and you uh, he yeah. broke a tackle. Gain of six on first down. On second, Ferguson to throw off for Henderson. He's got the first down and plenty more. It's the Daryl Henderson show early. He's brought down by Trey Neal. They'll move the sticks to gain a 20. You tackled him after a 20-yard game, which was significant, as we would find out later in the drive, because there was not a lot of – there was nobody behind you. So if you miss that tackle, he could be gone. Instead, you tackle him. Memphis turns the ball over later in that drive. They throw it like a lateral pass. That ball is out and loose, and it's it's recovered. Let's see. Let's say they have it, they do. It's Shaquem Griffin, who's always around the football. Uh, and then Shaquem Griffin recovered the fumble on that lateral pass, which would set up UCF's first touchdown to go to the lead. Here's Milton. Got a soft spot in the defense. It's Snelson again. Snelson to the end zone. There's our first touchdown of the afternoon. 24 yards. Milton to Frederick Snelson.
Thompson. What was the game plan going in against that Memphis offense? What was the keys you guys were hoping to accomplish against that dynamic team who had a tremendous backfield like Henderson, they Pollard. had Patrick Taylor, yeah, uh, yeah, and they had obviously uh, a, a Anthony Miller at wideout as yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah. They were loaded. So what was the yeah. game plan like? Oh, uh, so the first game plan, we, you know, some of the tendencies, they had a heavy tendency uh, when they, they were a big pistol team and big shotgun team. Um, I mean, I think 95% of their offense over the last two years were in pistol and shotgun just because they ran so many RPOs and they never wanted to give away which way. Um, so we knew that going into the first game, and they came out and ran that the first game. That's why we knew a lot of their RPOs going, um, a lot of where they were throwing the ball. And, of course, you know, Mike Hughes, was, I mean, that was probably the best, you know, cornerback performance I've seen on Anthony Miller. He had probably his college career. I think he had one catch. For 11 oh, yards. The three up. catches, just three yeah, catches, yeah. For not okay, many yeah. yards. Catches, something, yeah, it was it was absurd. I was like, okay, this this kid is legit. Uh, but uh, that second game, they, I mean, they went under center, and that was what shocked a lot of people. We were like, under? Why are they under center? They're, they're not a really a, you know, a pro style team, and I mean, they were running under center stuff. They were running screen passes, quick passes, and what we came to realize, they were tired of Shaquem in the backfield. So they were trying to just get the ball out quickly to him and slow him down early so that he would be hesitant pass rushing. Again, you're not slowing down to King Griffin no matter what. He's going to play with his hair on fire regardless. But, um, yeah, I mean, they were throwing screens. And we ran a lot of uh, a lot of our game plan was to pressure him and to get him rolling out to his left because when he scrambles out to his right, he can make – I mean, he was the NFL arm talent. He can make all the throws on his run to the right. So we were trying to pressure him to the left a lot more to make him scramble out to the left. And uh, that was really the game plan, you know, the basic game plan. I mean, there's a lot more nuances for I could tell you about each play. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when I was watching film on Henderson, Pollard, and uh, Miller, and uh, Patrick, the other running back, I noticed Henderson, you know, he was the, the super speed guy. I mean, he ran 4-3. So a lot of his runs, he wanted to break outside. So I knew on the screen, I'm like, okay, let me go attack. He's going to try to go outside. And I knew I was the only one back because I was in the post and I'm the last line defense. So I'm like, okay, he's going outside. Boom, I tackle him. Now, later in the game, he cuts up and I miss the tackle and he scores a touchdown on the run play. And that's when I was like, okay, he's, he's you know, this is an NFL guy. He's making, he knows that he goes outside. We know he knows. So he's changing it up. So, I mean, it was just that kind of cat and mouse battle. I mean, I can tell you a whole lot, a lot more, you know, whenever we get to these kind of questions uh, later down. But, there were a lot of cat and mouse battles between the defensive coordinator and their offense and, you know, some of the quarterback stuff and the linebackers calls and how we were playing and Miller and all of that stuff. But the game plan was to blitz the crap out of Ferguson to his left and make him scramble to his left because he was not comfortable throwing on the run moving left. Trey, uh, you know, as the game rolls on here, you know, I, you know, watching this game, I remember when this game ended or in the aftermath of this game, we talked about Mackenzie Milton's performance, and I sort of, I sort of undersold it, I sort of poo-pooed it because I remember the defense from Memphis just he was shredding them, but I thought the defense from Memphis just wasn't doing a good job, and and, there, and obviously, you know, Milton had some some throws here that were picked off, there were some big interceptions, but. <laughs> Early on, he's he's 15 for 16 in the second quarter, uh, yeah. with with two right. two six six three, and three touchdowns, and yeah, the defense isn't that tight for Memphis, but you you watch it, he's putting things completely on the money, compl like just total yeah. dime. The Texas Rangers farm system. Here's Milton lofting one. It's Aikens again, and it might as well be a home run for Jordan Aikens. Touchdown, UCF. What was it like that season to really watch him work, you know, in practice, go up against him? I mean, what are your memories like of 2017 Mackenzie Milton? Uh, I mean, those were – I tell people that that was the hardest practices going against that offense I've ever had to deal with in my life. Um, I mean, just the – of course they were a talented group. And, you know, you're led by Mackenzie who – I mean, we're, we call him little baby Manziel just the way he played. Um, but, uh, I mean, you look at the type of guys that we had on offense and then the way that they could play different positions is what made us the most dangerous. I mean, I used to tell them we could run 21 personnel sets, you know, tight end, fullback, running back, but all those guys could play receivers and we'd be an empty team. I mean, we used to put Jordan Akins, Traquan Smith, Otis Anderson, AK, 
and Marlon all on the field at once. But they can come out and you put Marlon at fullback, Otis in the slot, uh, AK at running back, Aikens at tight end, and Trey Quan at receiver and the uh, like receiver, and they'll come out and run eye formation stuff. So we're like, okay, do this. Then they'll break the huddle and go out five wide. So now we have linebackers guarding Aikens. We got linebackers on AK. You know, those are, that's the kind of mismatches you could create with that uh, talent. And, I mean, even the backup, you got Snelson, you know, not Snelson, not backup, but, you know, other guys just Franks, mm-hmm. Snelson, you know, even more running backs, Cordarius, uh, uh, Richardson, all those kind of guys. I mean, I mean, it was it was absurd, you know, just going against them every week. And then sometimes it will be an offensive practice, part of the practice, where – they're trying to run stuff just against, you know, whoever we're going against. The week. It was, we called it good on good. So we would give the scout look for the offense, but we would be running whoever they were playing that week. We were on defense running that. But just so that instead of going against scout team guys, you can go against us and we can get that kind of work too. And then they'd flip it sometimes. But, I mean, man, those practices, dude, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of trash talking. It was all in fun, but, you know, nobody wanted to, you know, we don't want to get beat. Nobody wants to get beat, and the offense doesn't want to get beat. They want to embarrass us. And we wanted to embarrass them on the field. So it was it was a good, healthy thing we did every week when we went against the offense. We called it good on good. So, I, you know, I appreciate that. That was one of the, the most fun times I've had, you know, just all that, uh, you know, all the talent on that field. Mm-hmm. What changed for McKenzie from 16 to 17? And maybe oh, you guys as a team as a whole, because, you know, you made it, you know, you went six and seven and 16, you were progress, but. You know, it was kind of still growing pains there. And then all of a sudden, everything just clicked in 17. Yeah. What change? Was it as simple as just knowing the system better? Was there a moment in, in during either the spring or in the fall of 17 where you guys thought, hey, we're gonna, we're, we could be pretty special here? What what changed, especially with McKenzie, who took his game to a different level? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, the one that powers the horse, man. That's, that guy is the – he was the offensive team that made – he – he didn't give us the confidence with his words, but with his play, we were like, okay, we got this guy in our corner. You know, we're in every game. And I think it changed. Uh, we were in fall camp. I mean, we, as a defense, we're dominating them. We dominated them 2016 when Coach Frost got there that spring. We dominated them that fall. We were dominating them in practice that year. Then even the next spring, we were dominating them. But I think in that fall camp, one practice, they came out, and I mean, they flat out embarrassed us the whole practice. I mean, like, from the first period until the last period, they embarrassed us. It was nothing tricky they were doing. It was nothing, you know, some of the flashy plays Coach Frost was doing. They were just they were just doing – they were just killing us. And, I mean, I think after that point, we were like, okay, these guys, you know, this is these guys are different. McKenzie was – I mean, it was unbelievable the throws he was making. Um, you know, the plays he was evasive. We were blitzing because we knew he struggled with blitz a little bit early. And he was just getting out of it, checking out of it. And, I mean, they were killing us. And I think after that point, we were like, okay, this is – I think this is the kind of offense that we were expecting, uh, you know, this high-powered offense. And, of course, you know, it carried over into the year. And, you know, that kind of confidence is good just because, I mean, the year before, we we were one of the top defenses in the uh, conference, especially, you know, on third downs where we, a lot of teams were trying to pass. So, them coming out, uh, you know, shredding us like that, that gave them the confidence. Of course, we were pissed off and we got, you know, we got our butts chewed out after practice. With that horrible performance. But, you know, deep down we knew, uh, you know, these guys, they have that, that it factor about them. They don't want to, they were tired of getting beat up every single practice. They wanted to, you know, beat us up. So that was good. Yeah. And it so set you, up a great run for sure. All right, matter. Yeah. Yeah, so you guys in this game break out to a, a 17-7 lead and the defense mm-hmm. is holding pretty strong. And then, and then the game sort of takes, I believe the path that many people thought it would, which is this sort of back and forth aerial show, or just a big play, you know, big play after big play offensively. Mm-hmm. As a defensive player, as the second quarter is going on, and 17 7 becomes uh, 17 14, and then 24 14, 24 21, 28 24. Yeah. As a defensive player, what are you thinking and what, what sort of adjustments are trying to be made on the fly for this Memphis, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, to stop this Memphis offense kind of as you near the end of the first half? Well, I mean, again, they're scoring so fast. We're only meeting probably four or five minutes on the sideline. So we're trying to correct everything. Of course, you cannot correct everything in five minutes on the sideline. Um, But, yeah, I mean, both of the offenses are scoring, I mean, lightning quick. You're talking four-play, five-play drives, 75 yards they're covering in a minute and a half. But um, they're scoring so quickly, and we're just like, what are they doing? We're like, Coach, we do not see what – I know defensively, we're like, Coach, these guys are running a totally different offense. 
I mean, they were in split back. They were in under center. They were they shied away from pistol all the way. And it was, I mean, we're like, okay, we're going to have to go back to, and that's what I, I talked about this a lot with this defensive group. We were pulling out things from four or five weeks ago, like, hey, you remember when we did this? Yeah, we need to run it like that. Okay, okay, that didn't work. Hey, you remember when we played SMU? Yeah, we need to run it like this. Hey, you remember when we played them the first time in Memphis? Run it this way. So we were calling – I mean, that's what we were going back. We're going back – you're talking about nine, eight, nine weeks of, you know, defensive coverage and defensive adjustments that we were making. And that's – you know, that was what – you know, in the second half, we did a lot of it. First half, we tried to, you know, stick to the original game plan, uh, make slight tweaks maybe in our alignments and, you know, stuff like that. But it just wasn't working. So we had to – we had to pull out all the – all the guns in this one. But, man, it was – it's hard to try to make all these adjustments and you know, I mean, uh, in real life, five minutes on the sideline. I mean, half the time we're trying to get, you know, people are trying to get retaped. They're trying to fix if they got a body tweak or something. Get some, mm-hmm. I mean, even just get some something to drink, the water and Bowery. But uh, so imagine, you know, coaches just yelling at us trying to figure that stuff out. You know, it's a lot. Uh, and then you know, trying to watch the offense and make sure that like, if they throw a pick or if there's a turnover, we got to get ready to run back on the field. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was a lot, and it's just it's crazy just because how fast everything was going, but time of the game was not going fast at all. It felt like we were going a hundred thousand miles an hour, but I mean, only two minutes were coming off the clock. So I was like, Good gracious, this is going to be a long game. I was like, yeah, you guys better stay hydrated because we're going to play over a hundred snaps. And I I couldn't I thought we were going to be done by the fourth quarter. So when we went to overtime, I was like, all right. <laughs> this this yeah. might go into the nighttime if we keep on playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was there was this yeah there was there was this one th- that second quarter is where the game flipped because you know it, it, it like like Murph was saying it was UCF scores uh, on a four play seventy six yard drive that was when McKenzie hit Traquan for from fifty yards out. Here's McKenzie Milton. Yeah. And it's 24-14 and I remember thinking okay all right we, you know we we caught we caught a couple punches from them but I I think we're going to be okay here we go. And then all, and then right after that you guys for you know hold them to a punt um and and we're getting the ball back up 24-14 and then all of a sudden so here's here's what happens the next six possessions up to halftime. Mm-hmm. UCF one play fumble. Memphis <laughs> Memphis two plays touchdown, UCF seven plays interception. Memphis five plays touchdown, UCF eight plays interception. Memphis eight plays field goal halftime, and then all of a sudden we're looking up on the scoreboard, and it's thirty one twenty four Memphis going into the break, and we're yep. like, oh my god, what the what hell that? happened here? <laughs> yep. What you guys? What did you guys say? I, I, I love the I love what you were talking about with like the little cat and mouse games the 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 little adjustments that you guys make it, it must have been like just the phenomenal mental puzzle that you guys were figuring out on the football field but when you guys were in that locker room at halftime and you're down seven what's everybody saying what's going on is it like it, it was there kind of this oh crap feeling or were you guys like you know what don't worry about it we got this we just got to change a couple oh. things. Yeah, we were, yeah, we were like, don't worry about it, guys. We got it. Uh, you know, on the field, I knew that fumble. I think it was uh, they threw like a screen or a hitch to Snelson, and he fumbled. What was Shaquille doing? That ball comes out. Loose ball. Memphis jumps on it. Drevrick Snelson had it, and then Jannard Avery recovered it. I knew that it was starting to turn because the excitement Memphis had. I'm like, okay, we got the ball up ten, about to go score again. This is this was. I felt like, okay, this is it. They're gonna quit. They're gonna be up because it's gonna feel like the first game, and they were defeated that first game. Right. But once they got that fumble, I mean, those guys were jumping around, excited. And, you know, the stadium was quiet. Not so much the thinking we're gonna give up 21 points unanswered the next. <laughs> three three four possessions but uh so going in the half we were just you know guys we we were just up 10 points there's nothing that you know nothing that we're doing wrong we just got to take care of the football and of course on defense stop the explosive plays i mean you're talking about they're scoring in two plays and five plays we got to stop the explosive plays make them work for it so uh defensively we hadn't uh we said we're going to go back to some other game plans 
we hadn't really picked up on what they were doing just because they had thrown in so much new things for us, which, again, I give a lot of credit to that head coach. He's, offensively, he was very, very good. I mean, again, he had the number two offense by Coach Ross, so you know he's really good. But uh, they had came out with, again, different things that we hadn't seen them run all year. So we were just trying to figure out, you know, up front, how they were blocking up us up front how they were trying to block us uh, in the secondary and then the second level with the linebackers and then the type of passing route concept we weren't we weren't really used to them running. We knew the route concept, they we just weren't expecting them to run it. So we kind of just picking it up, seeing what his reads were, and that was what we did going in the half. Now it changes a lot in the third quarter after the third quarter. We completely flipped. Like it completely flipped what we were gonna do. We'll be back with more on the 2018 American Athletic Conference football championship game with Trey Neal after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. Now let's return to our conversation with former UCF safety Trey Neal here on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. So in that third quarter, so and I'll go over again these because I'm looking at the possession breakdown. I thought I think that this is fascinating because. Well, don't forget, Memphis starts the second half with an onside kick. Yeah, right. That, and, and Marlon was, Williams recovers the ball, and I yeah. thought that was huge because I was stunned yeah, that they yeah. would even try that. With considering yeah. they had the momentum coming out of the locker room, they try the onside kick. Onside kick coming out of the locker room, and let's see. Can't take your onside eyes off this game for one moment. The Knights have recovered the onside kick, and they will start with great field position. On the plus side of the field. Marlin recovers. McKenzie scores from 16 yards out. Get off the field on third down. There's Milton right up the middle. Putting a green. And he's got a touchdown. McKenzie Milton for the score. And we're an extra point away from a tie game. 16 yards. Right in your face. Yeah. And we're tied. And, yeah. 30, and tied at and 31. But I want before, Jeff, you go through the rest of the quarter. A play that I, I wanted to bring up is Sean Dykes. That was a play they killed us with, the tight end, who only yeah, had 11 a, catches yeah. the yeah. whole year. Ferguson to throw. Got a man wide open. It's Sean Dykes. Dykes continues to rip off big plays, and he stumbles down inside the 25. Sean Dykes came into this game with just 11 catches on the season. And he, you know, he helped turn this game around in the second quarter. He, they hit for two big plays, and he catches another big play in the third quarter for 52 yards. Is that another example of things you guys hadn't seen before? Because yep. they were killing you with Dykes, who was not really a big factor in the offense, but was nah. in this game. He had over 160 yards in this game. Yeah. Not at all. We knew about uh, Magnifico. I think that was the other tight end. Mm -hmm. um, that was the one, you know, it was Anthony Miller with the running backs, uh, Pollard, Henderson, uh, and Patrick. And then we knew about Magnifico. Dykes, to us, was the blocking guy. We knew if he came in, a lot more run plays, a lot more pro-style run plays, because there was a lot of two tight end sets when he came in. So we went to, you know, our pro-style, you know, how we were going to defend the pro-style stuff defense. But, so I remember it was... On uh, defense, so I'm like, they're like, okay, Richie, get in there. I remember I told Richie, I said, look, if Dykes is in, they're going to run the football. And I take a hundred percent blame for that play. That <laughs> they little, they like ran a little bubble pass right past them. I told them if it's in, it's like 98 percent run. And of course, what do they do? They throw the ball to him. And I mean, Richie's flat-footed, coming up trying to make the tackle, and they throw the ball right behind his head. And the coach, I mean, the coach is ripping them. I'm like, oh, that was my fault. I told him that it was 100 percent run. So. Right. I got chewed. I mean, I got my butt ripped from the sideline for saying that. <laughs> even, even, <laughs> even though technically, right. like you look at all the tape, like it, it was, it was the right call. They just, they just pulled a fast one on you. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's when uh, I was like, okay, these guys are again. They were running a completely different thing than what they had put on film for twelve weeks, eleven weeks. That was not their tendencies. And you know, football is just a whole bunch of cat and mouse chess game of tendencies. We're just looking at tendencies and. 
when they come out and this stuff again you if you're talking about 98 personnel or 98 percent when dykes is in the game they run the football i mean what are you going to put your odds on them doing right you're gonna put them on the football and of course that was great great play call for them just to you know throw the ball but uh i knew I had went and told some of the offensive players, I said, these guys are scared of you when they onside kicked it. I said, nobody would onside kick if they trust their defense. We mm-hmm. never on because we trusted our defense. You know, whether we giving up 55 points or if we're giving up three points, we always trusted that we would make the play when we need it. That's when I told the offense, I said, these guys do not believe they can stop you the whole game. They're trying to steal possession so that they can keep the ball away from you. Right. I think that confidence helped them, you know, just from the, the slowness they came out with uh, – you know, those last few possessions of the second half, I think, you know, just seeing that was just like, okay, they're scared of us. Let's go, you know, assert our will. When you see that kind of thing, you know, in competitive sports, when you see a weakness or a flash of weakness, you attack it. I mean, some people don't like it, but whenever we see weakness, that's that's blood in the water. We're going to hunt. That's what we want to see. So yeah. I told them that, and, you know, after that, of course, they're going to score 40 more points later. <laughs> in the, throughout the rest of the game. So, you know, they, they took advantage of it. Yeah. Well, plus the fact that, they they call that onside kick out of the out of the locker room when they were up seven. Like you, if they were down fourteen or down ten, or, or, you know they up. score and then they do it again to try and like take the lead or tie the game. That's one thing. But they're up seven and they do that, so we recover yeah. it. And yep. um, uh, McKenzie runs in to tie it at thirty one, and then and then there was the the drive with the with the play to Dykes that you guys were talking about, but. Later on in that drive, I thought you guys made a critical stop on defense because they had first and goal at the five. And um, you stop Henderson for one yard. Ferguson, uh, 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 you stop Henderson. Ferguson misses Miller on second and goal. And then he throws the ball away on third and goal. And you hold them to that short field goal, which gave him a 34-31 lead. But you guys had to feel at that point like, okay, we... We that was a that was a bigger stop than just giving up three points, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you hold the number two offensive team to three points any drive. I mean, you you're you're taking it, man. Those guys are averaging 47, 40, 48 points a game like us. So we know we weren't really too much looking at the score as of the back. Like, okay, we give up just three right here, and our offense gives us seven. You know, we win that that little duo of uh, possession. And then we're going to flip it again and try to keep winning those small ones just so that, you know, when people start looking at the score, you're like, golly, they're scoring so many points. But at that point, you know, it's 0-0 again just because how close it was. It's 31-31. You can wipe that slate clean. It's 0-0. Let's go ahead and now play. Now, you know, it's 3-0 at that point. So we're just kind of keep that back and forth kind of thing going just to keep the – it's a, it's, a, it's the mindset of it. You know, you see – you giving up 45 points in the game, you're going to be like, oh, my goodness, we're terrible on defense. No, we're like, no, we're just, you know, this is college football. These guys are on scholarship just like us. They're NFL players, you know, just like the guys we had on our team. You know, this is this is going to happen if you have good players. People are going to score, especially in football nowadays. It's more of an offensive type of game. You know, we can barely touch anybody on defense. We can't hit the quarterback, things like that. So points scored if you're good enough. Yeah. So now, so now it, this is how the possessions go after that. So it was, so, so it was touchdown UCF field goal Memphis mm-hmm. touchdown UCF again on a seven play 65 yard drive to go up 38, 34. You guys mm-hmm. force a punt, get the ball back. Offense scores again after four plays. That was the 28 yarder to Snelson. So it was 45, 34 after Memphis mm-hmm. missed that field goal. Then yep. we go down. It was a 10-play drive, but we only get three out of it to make it 48-34. I think, uh-huh. I think Murph and Eric and myself, we were watching this game thinking, okay, Memphis is still in this because if you score the touchdown, it's 52-34. That could have yeah. that could have been it, right? But yep. But at that, but then the next drive, it's only a field goal. Matt Wright makes it, and then second down and six. On the ground, here's Pollard making people miss, staying in bounds. Tony Pollard, one of the easiest touchdowns he'll ever score. How about 66 yards for the touchdown? And things just got a lot closer and a lot quieter. Tony Pollard runs 66 yards for a touchdown to make it 48-41 right after. And all of a sudden, it's a one-score game. So tell us about that little exchange right there and what happened that, that – that again flipped the momentum. Yep, again, that game was about momentum. Uh, 
you know, they were on the ropes after that punt, you know, down 11. You know, we're driving about to score. You know, you're thinking that we might score again. And that, that would, I thought, would have put it away. Up eight, mid third quarter, late third quarter. You're going to have to come out and throw the ball, like, all over us. And we knew just the guys we had. We wanted them to come out and just try to throw the whole game because we had, you know, that we had just gotten the veil back. We had Deb, we had Bam, we had Chris Johnson, we had Richie we could put in, AC. You know, that's what we wanted them to do because we had the depth. We didn't want them to have to throw on our, you know, on our linebackers and slot cover. You know, they were putting Tony Pollard on some of our D linemen, on some of our backers. That's the, that's the mismatch they wanted. We wanted them to have to guard, you know, Richie Grant on Tony Pollard or uh, Mike Hughes on some of those guys and Navelle and Bam. That's what we wanted them. But, uh, you know, when we got that field goal, they kind of could stick to their game plan just a little bit more and see what worked. And then, of course, Pollard strikes out for 66 yards and we go from up 11 and then up 14 to down up seven. So, you know, those kind of momentum swings are, you know, it's, it's a game of just a whole bunch of momentum and who can control it and who can take advantage of it. And that's what they did at that point. They took advantage of it. Uh, I well, wanted to was, put- well, I was going to say real quick, Murph, and what's crazy about that, the Pollard play, prior to that, the crowd was chanting, we want Frost. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I remember I was doing stats for the IMG national radio broadcast, and Murph, you were in the press box, so I don't know, you could tell me also, but they were chanting, we want Frost, and we can hear it to the point where oh, wow. they even showed it where Scott Frost tipped his cap to the crowd, which was oh, an wow. incredible moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> On TV, I don't know if the players where you guys were aware of that or not. Of oh, course, no, we would, next I thing would. you know, Tony. <laughs> next thing you know, Tony Pollard breaks once and ruins everybody's mood. But right. uh, yeah, that was Irv, in the, that was nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter, too. Right, uh, yeah. Murph. Do you remember that sequence there with the whole chanting for Frost, and, and then obviously the Pollard playing? You could go with right there with your next question with for Trey. But that was a unique moment at that time. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that was my question because I wanted to know if he had any memory of that. But yeah, I remember that, and it was. <laughs> It was weird. It was weird to see him. Not only did we hear it because it was it was loud and deafening, and the fans knew what was going on with Scott and all the rumors. They knew, and there was a bunch of signs in the crowd. But to have Scott acknowledge it during the game was was interesting as well. But I assume Trey, you're just so locked in on your. Oh ears. yeah. You can hear that. Yeah, I mean, I've I rarely heard the yell into the crowd the whole game. I mean, that's how locked in we were. We I wasn't even aware until. The only time I really listened to it was halftime, and that was just because, you know, everybody was cheering, come on, God, you know, stuff like that. But during the yeah. games, I mean, I was never – I we I never – I really toned that stuff out. It was always not quiet, but it was just like a, a light little buzz in my head, I guess. But I never heard just a whole bunch of screaming when I played, so I, I wasn't even aware of that. I, that was the first time I've ever heard that, even going back and watching it. So I've never even – I don't even remember that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, the, the people listening should know that going into this fourth quarter, there had already been there had already been 113 plays run, and more than 1,100 yards. Uh, it was it was amazing. Um, so after the after Pollard breaks one, and I, and I will disagree a little bit with here with Jeff. When you steps up, when you guys were up 14, doesn't tend to play. Mm-hmm. And you're at home, and the offense is rolling. I'm feeling pretty confident. I know you guys are still very much in the moment, but I'm. As a fan, and I'm I'm, I'm in the I'm in the press box. I'm like, you know what? This is looking pretty good. Within yep. six, within six minutes, this game is tied. Yep. And was it at all after the after the, they they tied up on a on a really good throw from Ferguson to Miller? Ferguson to throw that way, and it's Anthony Miller. Did he hang on? He did. Touchdown, Anthony Miller. You had the best player for Memphis against the best player for UCF. Hughes at the corner, and his coach said he's confident in guarding anybody in the country man-to-man. This is just great football. He's in position, the ball is thrown perfectly, and there's not many receivers better than Anthony Miller going up in tight windows and bringing down a touchdown. Hughes is in really good coverage there. He's a really, he's like, he's in good position, and Miller just has tough hands. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh. How good was Anthony Stop. Miller? <laughs> that was man, that dude, I'm telling you, man, that guy was legit. And that, and really that watching Anthony Miller showed me a lot about uh Mike Hughes, man. I mean, that guy was again, you guys I mean, he, he's unbelievable, man. I've never seen a guy, you know, with that kind of sticky skills. He reminded me of if Shaquille was shorter, that's what he is. 
Mm-hmm. Like that's they're 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 both of those guys are that type of explosive player. And I mean, Shaquille his senior year didn't get thrown at as much like that. Um, I think they they were they were a lot more scared to throw to him. But I think because Mike Hughes was you know he was new, they thought he was new to the defense. Um, they were gonna attack him. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. I mean, he was locking <laughs> up. I mean, guys week in and week out. I mean, he locked up Anthony Miller the first game, uh, Cortland Sutton. Uh, some of the kid, the kid on other, other kid on SMU, Trey Quinn, who plays in the NFL. He, I mean, he was taking care of those guys. He was taking them out of the game. Yeah. And, uh, Anthony Miller has started heating up a little bit, so we're like, all right, Mike, you're you're, you're the projected first rounder. Go make the money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what that's what turned it into. Uh, so, you know, it's just at that point, it was better. You know, who who's got the, the better guy? And at that point, you know, Anthony Miller made a great play. I mean, Mike Hughes is one of the strongest guys I know, and he held on to that football. So. uh Mm-hmm. Anthony Miller, I mean, he was a strong and he was he was a guy that if you showed any weakness, he was going to I mean, he was going to try to kill you every time that was Anthony Miller. So we knew that. I mean, we we were we were dogs in our own right. So that wasn't the mentality. I mean, we talked to him after the game. He's like, this is the best, you know, little group that he went up against. But uh, yeah, I mean, that guy, that guy was he was the first round type of guy. I think he failed just because, you know. He's coming out of a small school, stuff like that. But, uh, man, he's really good, man. He's really good. Yeah. He reminds so, me a lot of, like, Steve Smith. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. That's I a like good call. Yeah. Smith, former receiver. So, we thought this game was crazy already at this point. I mean, it's 48-48. I mean, Miller <laughs> yeah. makes that incredible catch. And then it the totally game, loses its mind. <laughs> big time. Um, and there was controversy because – with a third and nine, about a minute, minute 56 to go, Riley Ferguson get, you get sacked. Shaquem Griffin and Jasinski sack him. Everybody's yeah. going crazy. But it turns out the refs come out and say, well, wait, there was a delay of game. It didn't yeah, count. That, oh, my gosh. Oh, <laughs> man. Uh, which of- Ferguson trying to escape. And he has swung out of bounds around the neck area. There is a flag down. Of course, it's Shaquem Griffin and Pat Jasinski. It's an 11-yard loss. We'll check the marker. There are zeros on the play clock prior to the prior to the snap. Delay game. Offense. Five-yard penalty. Third down. Please reset the game clock to 2 0 That's the third time in this game. Which set up a third and 14, which they convert. They hit Henderson on a 36-yard play. You make the tackle yep. on that play. If you don't make that tackle, he's gone. And he scores the game, uh, maybe the game-winning touchdown for all we know. Who knows? Instead, you tackle him at the 25-yard line. Mm-hmm. You guys hold him. Memphis settles for a 46-yard field goal, which is blocked. The pl- the building goes yeah. crazy, yeah. except the reps come back and say, wait, Ooh, delay, delay of game. game. Here's Riley Patterson from 46. He's already missed from 46 today. Oh, the way it's blocked. It is blocked. And picked up by UCF. Titus Davis came up with the football. There is a flag down. Oh, my Again. God, yeah. <laughs> Oh uh, and they set up a 51-yard field goal, which fortunately Riley Patterson misses. It was his second miss of the quarter. But yep. I'm assuming you guys didn't hear any whistles because I didn't hear any no. whistles. Nobody we did. Were, we, there were no – I heard not one whistle. I mean, even if you see – we didn't even hear the whistle when uh, – you're talking when Titus blocked it. We didn't even hear the whistle when uh, – not Titus. When uh, somebody blocked and Titus caught it, we didn't even hear the whistle to stop that play. And they were like, oh, we blew that play dead long ago. We're like, uh, <laughs> uh, no, we didn't hear anything. But uh, – that third and four or the third and nine on the sack, we saw the delay of game, but we thought the ball was snapped, so we just kept playing. So we you know we get a sack. Like, oh, it was a delay of game. I was thinking, I'm like, can we decline that delay of game? But then I'm like, they don't even, you know, they don't even. Right, it's a, it's a dead ball happened. foul. Yeah, yeah, they didn't even acknowledge that the play happened, so we had to redo it. But um, yeah, we, we knew that when the field goal kicker. I don't know if you guys remember, he was struck. He struggled uh, a few weeks prior with kicking mm-hmm. field goals. He was, I think he, mentally he was, I think mentally he had been, and he come down and misses the chip shot early uh, in the game. So I think mentally, and that, you know, that's one of those things about kicking that, you know, I'm thank God for Matt Wright. Cause that guy, he was, he was not aloof as a person, but he was just like, look, man, I'm gonna make it. Don't worry about me. I'm like, uh, you go ahead, buddy. <laughs> you take that <laughs> <out."> So, uh, 
And then, uh, so I knew that he was flustered. And then when you get your kick blocked and you got to go kick it again five yards deeper, yeah, I was like, I don't think he's going to make this. But, you know, crazier things have happened. But me personally, I was like, I don't think he's mentally ready for this. And the crowd's going crazy. Game's tied. You know, those are those are some – those are tough moments, you know, man. Those are tough moments. You know, that's that's kind of funny you, you say it because, like, it, it went. It was such a wild swing of emotions watching the game, you know, as a reporter and as a fan. Because especially that blocked field goal sequence, because Titus returns it. There's what 30, 30 28 seconds to go, right? Thirty some seconds to go, and and he returns it back, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like now we could have a We're chance like, to win the game. Right? Yeah, yeah, like one or two passes, and then it's field goal time. Get out there, kick it, and, and then we're done. All of a sudden, you know, out of the out of the cloud of chaos comes this delay of game, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Because it gave Memphis a huge break. They get another shot at the kick. Yep. Exactly. Even though it's five yards, and even though it's five yards, and Elo, I think I remember, I remember telling you this, and I was like, I was like, are you kidding me? They're going to get another shot at this if they make this. And you're, and you were like, no nah way. They're not. He, there's no way he's going to make this. I'm like, I see. <laughs> listen, I've seen stranger things happen. 50, you know, 51 <laughs> yards. It's not easy, but it's makeable. It's not super difficult either. Right. It's it's makeable. You know, all he's got to do is hit it right, and all of a sudden, you're down three with 28 seconds left. Riley Patterson, true freshman. How are you doing? Tell me about when that field goal, when he missed it, what were you guys feeling? Uh, I mean, there was legitimately guys were – there were so much emotion that game. I could not believe – like, I could not believe what I was witnessing. I was like, this is like a movie, what we're going through right now. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Like, just so much emotion, especially late. I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is going on? And, I mean, Shaquem Griffin is – after Titus is – tried to return that ball this dude is exhausted and he had to go out and get another block the dude gets on the side he's like i need some just give me a minute just to think and get my mentally just like clear his head just because everything's going on so the coach didn't even talk to him we're just like okay this is overtime for us at least this is overtime where we win the game because we got the ball back so they're not even talking to us on the sideline we're just sitting there soaking it in just like relaxing clearing our mind they're not saying a single word to it then you know offense come back up so they're like okay let's go you know watch the offense and support these guys and if i were mistaken did they did memphis get the ball back again they did that? they did yeah, so they did. Like, so with 21 milton, with 21 yeah. seconds milton threw it on first down he throws incomplete second down he throws a pick milton to throw middle of the field it's intercepted it's jonathan and 14 seconds left and Memphis will take over and uh Jonathan Cook went down at the at the uh at the 40 yard line uh at their own 40 yard line and there's 14 seconds and like and I started thinking back to um 2014 and Hale Perriman and I was like oh no all they need is one you know 10 yard out and then you know they're in, they're in hail mary they're they're in hail mary territory right so yep. but then Titus Davis makes a tremendous play with that huge sack of Ferguson to end regulation. Here's Ferguson trying to step up. He's grabbed from behind and thrown down. Titus Davis got him. Five seconds left. And Memphis with all three timeouts. That's the end of regulation. Media timeout. With all three timeouts, Memphis will take it home with them. At that point, what was what was that like? And at that point, you guys must have been like, this game has completely lost its mind. What is yeah. happening here? <laughs> this game has legitimately lost. It, we were like, it, this game has lost. We've lost our minds. Like, what in the world is going on? I mean, I'm sure it was fun to watch, you know, on TV. If you're not, you know, you're not rooting for any team. But I know we probably put so much stress on UCF fans that game and I thought you know I thought the USF game was a crazy game I was part of but I mean who would have known that a week later it would be even wilder um and I think really what made it even crazier was just what was on the line for us I mean again we know we know what's on the line for us again at the time we're just like you know we're just gonna handle our business but you know once it started getting closer and closer now we're in fourth quarter and now we're in overtime it's just like 
everything matters now. Every now it feels like legitimately every play we do matters. Every step we take has to be the right step. So it, that's just kind of you know that's the kind of stress it was. And again, it was it was fun. Don't get me wrong. I I loved it. You know, just because you 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 see what guys are made of in that time. Uh, you see the kind of guys that you have. And again, we never know until those kind of moments what kind of team we are. Uh, and you know, all summer we had gone through you know the program, and you know we thought we were that team. We felt it, and you know throughout the year, you know we were beating teams pretty good. But you know that was one of the moments where we were like, this team, you know, we're different. You know, and you know we go in, going into overtime, feeling confident just because you know we're here. It's zero zero again. Let's play. Yeah, I, 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 that's the thing I really admired about you guys that year was a get to win a game like this. The mental toughness it takes to concentrate on. All, like you said, all those all those little adjustments, those little refinements, all throughout this yeah. marathon game like that must have been. Uh, it, it was a it was a master class in how to play as a team. Go ahead, Eric. I know you had a question. Well, I think the thing about the Cook interception, Milton threw the ball. It, it was so low that actually it helped us because it forced right. Cook to land on the he ground. Had the ball. And, yep. so, he had to fall. Yeah. yeah, he had to fall down to make the pick. Otherwise, he might be running and might right. get into Memphis territory. Uh, so the game goes to overtime. Now, Murph, it, it, this was a crazy game. Again, I'm working the radio with uh, Alan Bestwick and Tony Pike, who's a former Cincinnati quarterback, and they couldn't believe it. And my job was to keep track of all the stats, which is uh, – yeah. that was not – that was uh, – <laughs> to say the least. Thanks, guys. Um, so I think you had Steve Levy, obviously, is doing the game with Brian Greasy and Todd McShay on ESPN, and they're going crazy over how this game is so nutty and, and, and wild and – Stuff like that. Now, Murph, at this point, you're down on the field, right? With some of the media at this point. Yeah, actually, uh, to you know, to sort of, uh, I am, I am basically in the corner of the end zone that Trey will end up in at the end of this game. I'm right in that corner, <laughs> uh, so that's where I'm watching this. I'm, I've been there for the last five minutes of the fourth quarter, so I was, I, it was on that side of the field where you saw both of the uh, of, of uh, Riley Patterson's kicks. Uh, uh, get one get blocked and the other one missed. Mm -hmm. I yep. was on that side and it was um it was wild. It was absolutely wild. Uh, I I thought for a second when McKenzie throws that pick because it was really intended for no one in particular. There was some some miscommunication. I, yeah. My heart dropped, kind of like Jeff explained. Like oh my god, did we just throw this game away? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like we already we already dodged three bullets on the last possession. Now we're giving him another one. <laughs> <laughs> Trey, you guys, so you guys make it to overtime, and like you said, clean slate. Let's go play. Yeah. Uh, UCF win. UCF wins the toss, and as is you know smart to do, they they allow it to kick. Um, Memphis drop. Memphis's first drive there. Memphis's uh, opening possession of overtime. Uh, it's uh, Patterson to Miller for a touchdown. Ferguson to throw. Good time. Man wide open for the touchdown. Who else? Anthony Miller. And the Tuckers draw first blood in overtime. Touchdown, Memphis. Miller lines up at the point of view of the defense and the point of view of the defense in the right slot against yep. Novell. And it looked like there was some miscommunication between you and Novell as to who has yep. who. Do you remember that play? Yep, exactly. It was uh in the far end zone, away from uh where they were kicking. But um Yeah. Yeah, so so the adjustment we made in the fourth quarter, we had noticed that um in shotgun, he was checking the play. With his uh, with the coach, I, I keep forgetting his name. He's the head coach at uh, Florida State. I Mike Norvell. Mike Norvell. Yeah. Norvell yeah. yeah. So uh, Riley uh, Ferguson was checking because they they knew one of our signals in our coverage. So whenever we would signal, they were checking the play to beat that coverage. So in the fourth quarter, we picked up on it, and so we told our coach, we're like, look, we're gonna you we're gonna run a different coverage, but we're gonna use that exact same signal so we can get them to throw the ball. Well, so I'm looking at Neville. I'm like, okay, boom, this is the ball. This is what we're covered. We're running, but we're not really running this coverage. We're running what we just talked about coming out. He looked at me. I said, okay. So I go to a disguise. It's covered. We're running cover three. So the problem was, and not coverage, if Mike, if uh, Anthony Miller's in the slot, we got to check out. I was looking at the left side to tell Kyle and then tell uh, Bam what we were running. So when I, I look back to the right, I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy's in the slot. I'm yelling at the bell. The bell, you gotta man him up. You have to man him up. You gotta man him up. Cause I'm gone. I'm not. I'm not gonna have help anymore. I'm not gonna have his help inside. I gotta lean yeah. back to the other side. They put him in the slot. So we're like, the bell, your help is gonna be Mike outside. Scoot inside, and Mike's your help outside. That's what the coverage was. The bell never. I mean, again, 
it's loud or it's crap in there. Um, so he never looks back at me. I can't, you know, just abandon everybody else. So I got to stay. I tried to hold it as long as possible. But again, Ferguson had made his mind up. I'm going to Anthony Mello the rest of the game going out, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he was he, he's not going to anybody else. He's going to his guy. They had built up that, uh, you know, that quarterback receiver repertoire, you know, for I think two or three years at that point. So, mm-hmm. you know, he had made up, he snapped the ball and he was looking right there and he threw it right to him for a touchdown. And we, you know, we figured that one quick just because how fast it happened. We didn't know if Miller was on the fly. He hadn't really played slot since the first or second quarter of that game. You and, know, uh, they come out first playing overtime and put him in the slot. Right. You know, that's interesting because, I, you know, I remember, I, I don't know if you watched the, that show that's on ESPN Plus, that detail. And uh-huh. I, I've watched the ones with Peyton Manning, and he actually uh-huh. said kind of the same thing, that sometimes when you're on offense, um, you can cross a defense up when you're on the road because the crowd is so loud. Like they, Everyone always talks about how hard it is for the offense to communicate. It's also hard for the defense to communicate. Like yep. how, how much uh, – it, it, how – I guess if you could describe that, like how how do you guys kind of try to work around that, and how much of a factor was that in that game? Sometimes, well, it, it's it's much harder for defense to communicate. I feel because again, the bell's locked in. He's looking at the receiver, and I'm behind him. He can't. It's you know, it'd be crazy for them. We don't know when the offense is going to snap the ball, so he doesn't want to look back and then they snap the ball, and now nobody knows what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Offensively, you know, if a receiver's talking to a, or a quarterback wants to get the attention of a receiver. Most of the time, they're already looking at the ball, so they know when to run. If you can't hear, you have to look at the ball to be snapped. So they're looking that direction. Quarterback can kind of wave off, give a hand signal. Okay, I know what I'm doing. So that whole line, and they can just walk up and talk to the line. I can't, you know, if I'm in the post, I can't run 15 yards up to Neville on the line of scrimmage. Right. Hey, man, we need to do this. And they run 15 yards back into the post. You know, they'll snap the ball and throw a touchdown. So well, I'm trying to scream at him at the top of my lungs to get his attention, but he couldn't hear me. So, uh, you know, a lot of that, that's where it works kind of against you just because you know, when we, we get our checks and then we lock in on defense. You know, we, we had great communication that whole year. Again, it's just – it was one of those uh, tendencies we missed where if he's in the slot, they're going to the, him in the slot majority of the time. Mm-hmm. But we have to be in the right coverage to make the throw harder. That was an easy throw. I mean, he got an inside release. He's wide open. That's an easy throw. You That's pitch and catch. If Neville slides inside and we get that check, he's going to have to throw it back shoulder but. We already told Mike, disregard that receiver. He's not going to him. They put a, it was a decoy out there. So Mike could have came and helped Neville on the back shoulder throw. But, right. I mean, it's hindsight now. Everything's perfect. <laughs> so, by the way, it, it, yeah. I think it's worth noting, uh, Riley, incredible. He made yeah. some throws. Oh, he was great. Uh, yeah. Talk about yeah. him. I mean, we haven't really mentioned him, but he was yeah. matching throw with throw with Milton, and he was on fire. Yeah. He complete. I mean, he couldn't he, miss a pass in the first half. Yeah. It seemed like he was yeah. a, he was fantastic, and he had great yeah. wheels too. So he's hard to, to kind of deal with as well. Yeah, yeah I got I got his numbers right here. He was thirty of forty two for four seventy one, four touchdowns and an interception. <laughs> Goodness gracious! Yeah, man, that guy. He he's again. We knew at the uh, you know after watching them early in the year when they played UCLA, I believe. I remember our DB coach was like, this guy, is he has NFL talent, uh, you know, as far as making the throws everywhere. And I remember the first game, I was in uh, cover three. I was playing the flat. He was on the left hash, and he threw the ball to the right. He threw the ball on a comeback route, which is like a 15-yard out route over by the sideline. He threw the ball out of bounds to his receiver, and I jumped and tried to swat it, and he threw that from the left hash to the right sideline. I was like, this guy is absurd if he just made this throw. And they were like, oh, completion. I said, yep, well, not, not too much I can do for that throw. And that's when I kind of knew, like, okay, this guy, he can make every throw. We have to have perfect coverage on him. And then, I mean, he proved it again. I mean, he proved it every every game he was playing that, you know, he was a NFL kind of talented arm. And, again, you know, the NFL is hit or misses. It depends on how, you know, a lot of factors other than, you know, just your talent that go into it, so. But I definitely know that he had the arm strength and the accuracy for those kind of, you know, those kind of plays. Yeah. So in the overtime, they score first. Now the offense is feeling the pressure. But then yeah. they come down kind of, you know, yeah, 25 yards. But methodically move the ball down the field. And then Adrian runs it in from two yards out. Yep. And a little speed option. Yep. yep, little speed option, which I know you guys have mm-hmm. seen in practice enough to make yourselves yeah. sick. <laughs> um, you're probably seeing that in your sleep. And now we're tied at 55. And then it switches where the now UCF gets the ball first in overtime number two. Now, as a defense, 
what or, and as a defensive player, what did you prefer? Did you want to have did you want to be out there on the field first or second? We uh we always wanted to be out there um we wanted to be out there second just because we knew that if we went up we could ma- we knew we could stop like say like when we went up seven we knew that okay we have the ability to stop them right now mm-hmm. we know that we we kind of know what the situation is as well you so know they have to score a touchdown they can't do anything else so fourth down there's no reason to jog off the field for a field goal they're going for a touchdown you know it just kind of it, cl- it clears everything up going second same thing uh, i'm sure that's why everybody defers just because if they kick a field goal you're like, okay, all we need to do is a field goal. And most kickers, you know, at the 25-yard line, you can make that without – you can take a knee three times, and you should still be able to kick a field goal, you know, mm-hmm. about 50 mm-hmm. yards. I know we could do that. But uh, so I think before the game um, – or before we went out there, I was, I remember we were telling them, like, look, if we score here a touchdown and we get an interception, play is, like, fall down. I remember telling them that. I said, but, but before the first overtime, we went out first. I said, if we get an interception or a fumble or turnover, we're going to try to score. Right. Like, don't like. So I, I, I kept on reminding them. I kept on reminding them. Like, okay, if y'all get a pick right here in this first drive. Don't fall. Return it all the way back if we can. We need to practice. Like, just know. And so the guys, like, okay, okay, okay. And then when we went to the second overtime, I'm like, look, if we if we get an interception, now we need to fall. If we get a fumble, fall because if we get stripped and they pick it up, they can score again. So like, don't then they get the ball back again. So don't 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 make anything. You know. It's just those little things that, you know, a lot of times you're not really thinking about at that moment. But, you know, I just made sure that, you know, we all reinforced and kept reinforcing and the coaches were kept reinforcing this as well. Just so, you know, once you hear it so much, you're just going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember you saying that right before I did it. Didn't they also just change the rule that year or not long before that where you could return something? Because it used to be in an yep, overtime. Exactly. If you, if you turn the ball over, the play would be dead, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hmm. Now they said you could return it. Um, so, like, Say on that play with Navelle and uh, that he threw the Miller, if Navelle would have caught a pick, he could have returned it for a touchdown, and the game would have been over. And ended the game, right? For a touchdown, they just the play's dead, and you don't get the ball from wherever he returns it to. You get it again. They just recess to the twenty-five. Hmm. But say we score a touchdown, then we can. That's the game over. Right. So. So, so overtime number two, UCF gets the ball first, false start, moves him back, yeah. and then. McKenzie hits McKenzie hits Marlin for ten, and then a roughing the passer call moves the ball yep. ten yards more. McKenzie runs it within one yard, and then Otis runs it in. So now it's sixty-two fifty-five. On the ground, Otis Anderson trying to find the second hole there. There's the indication for the touchdown. Otis Anderson gets there. Knights back on top in the second overtime. So now you guys are heading out there with a, with a seven point lead, as opposed to trying to keep the game tied. And now, what, what's the what's the what's the mo of that pres- of that possession right there at that point? Obviously, yeah, you're saying if you get a turnover, fall down. But in addition, what are you guys thinking that okay, this is what we have to stop now? So we were like, okay. They're going to give us some fake. We know what they're trying to do. They're going to get the ball to Anthony Miller. I mean, this is what they're going to, they're going to lose the game. They're going to lose trying to get it to Anthony Miller. Um, you know, he's the senior. He's their senior leader. Him and uh, Ferguson are the senior guy. They're going to – that's what they want. They're going to get that mismatch somehow. So they come out. I think they run the ball. And then yep. – Taylor ran for uh, three yards. Yep. So now second and seven, we're like, okay, they're about to try to, you know – they look for Anthony Miller, whoever. And th- this is where we started getting into our man stuff. Um, we're like, okay, Mike, you need to follow Anthony Miller. And let's – we're not going to travel you into the slot because he didn't really play slot that much that year. We had Navelle that was playing slot. Bam had played slot more. Uh, Richie had played the slot more. So we didn't want to travel Mike somewhere he wasn't – you know. He could play it. Don't get me wrong. He could have played it. But he didn't know the uh, leverage he had, where his help was, stuff like that. That's just – you know, that just takes practice. We just put Mike outside and say, take, get rid of him and the rest of the game. But, um, so I know that they were trying to get the Miller. I know that, um, something happened where we were third and long. I don't remember what happened on second down, but it was a third and long and then fourth and long. That's what I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He well, got that. pushed to third and 17, right, Murph? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, well, it was third and, you know, it was fourth and seven. Fourth and, and seven, third right. Third play. Right. But, the, the, but I don't know if you remember this. And there's a couple of things I want to bring up in this overtime before we get to the ultimate play. 
But on that fourth and seven, Patterson uh, Ferguson does go to Miller, who makes an incredible yep. like mid-air 360 spinning catch. Yep. Need to get to the 15. Fourth and seven. Here's your ball game. Here's your championship. Ferguson throws and completes. What a catch! Kids a warrior, man. Everybody on the planet knew Anthony Miller would be the intended target. It doesn't matter. He makes the play. The guy's incredible. The guy was incredible. Yeah, yeah. We we knew. I think it was uh, like fourth and fifteen. Fourth. It was something. Fourth and long. And I was like, okay. And guess where he was in the slot? So we knew if he's in the slot, they're going to him in the slot on some route. They went with check with him. We were in two man, which is just you know, everybody's man covered with uh, help underneath, um, and there was help deep, safety deep. But we knew that he was in that we were in two man. So the coach, we were trying to disguise it. We tried to show it like it was cover one. Throw him on the so they would throw a fade ball, which is a harder throw to make. Um, but we had kind of gave away our coverage late, so they checked. He again, he checked with his coach. Coach called. I think it was like a ten yard. It was the out route to the stick. So we ran speed turn to the sticks. And, I mean, he made an absurd catch. And, again, Navelle played perfect cover. I was like, dude, there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> that was just a great throw, even better catch. There's nothing you can do about that. So, because uh, we had his help. Navelle was playing inside leverage. They throw an out cut. Navelle played an out cut from inside leverage. as close as you're going to play an out cut from inside leverage. And, again, it was just, I mean, he made a acrobatic catch. And I was like, oh, well, you win some of those, you lose some of those next play. And I think that was the – thing uh i don't know if you guys remember Navelle when we played temple he was so flustered from that uh 2016 his first year he was so flustered from the long drive that he got thrown off in the last play and he wasn't Ooh. ready for that so i was told i remember that whole year his growth and i think that you know that speaks to his growth the whole you know that it ate him up just for because of that and it wasn't even his fault that they scored on that play but um that when we lost to temple it was like one second left it wasn't even his fault on that yeah but, um it ate him up just because, you know, he could have done something to change it. So that whole offseason, he was working. I mean, man, he – even after that fourth down play, he was like, I'm good. Let's go next play. And I knew at that point, I said, okay, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, this kid is growing up, man, right in front of our face. I mean, the bell was – he was a lot to handle when he first got there, man. As a lot of guys, you know, 18-year-olds are. But uh, <laughs> just seeing that – just seeing that maturity from him uh, – Especially in that moment, you know, you just get beat on what, you know, seems like, oh, my gosh, again, they just got a fourth down. What kind of crap is this? You know, you see that maturity from him just, hey, man, we got this. I'm good. Don't worry about it. Let's get this next play. And, then you know, that just, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, wow, you know, outside of football, man, it's just like, wow, this kid, you know, he's growing up, man. So, all right. So it's uh, so they convert that fourth and seven at the 22 down down to the five. Uh, yes. Taylor runs for a loss of four. That was a big play, yeah. kind of push him back a little bit. Um, yeah. Of course, it, but I it also that was pit, pit to tackle. Pit yeah, a great play. Now, now it's also one of those things where it also gives that offense a little bit more room to work too, because mm-hmm. they have about four extra yards to play with. So, let, so let's go to the big play. Let's go to yeah. it's second and goal at the nine. And I've actually I got it pulled up on YouTube here, so I can so I can look at it. So they come out. <laughs> In 12, it looks like 12 yep, personnel. 12 but, personnel, but Magnifico is like off like a fullback. He's right, he's, an, way back. he's yep. an H back to the left. Yep. So so yep. Ferguson's in the gun, Henderson's to his right. Yep. At so the, that's a heavy, R, at, with that formation, mm-hmm. that is a heavy RPO kind of set where there's a run pass option. But again, we know they're not about to run the ball and they just lost four yards. They're about to try to throw the uh, Miller. Now, right. see, I didn't know where Miller was at that time. I had no idea where he was. I, we were in uh, zero. We we're like, okay, they're about to run the ball or throw a quick RPO. We're going to put in man and we're blitzing him. If he doesn't have the read, he's going to get sacked again. That was our thinking on that play. So, he's, so we got everybody in man coverage. Right. So he's yeah he split to the he split to the right. Everyone's in everyone's in man and yep. with no cushion basically. No so cushion. Yep. The action on the play was Magnifico comes from the Sorry. from the left side of the offense where you're right. Yep. Across yep. the, the right. formation, and they and they sort of play fake to, um, to uh, to Henderson, and Ferguson yep. is looking at Miller the whole right. He's running this yeah, slant. Exactly. It's the slant. Yeah, right. It's the RPO. It's, we call it the RPO slant. The read is if uh, since it's zero, he already sees it zero. He knows I'm throwing the ball because hmm. I don't have. They're going to tackle 
the running back from the backfield. So he knows off rip off of the shell is zero coverage. He's throwing the football. So what's interesting here is at, as the play starts, mm-hmm. the tight end that's on the right hand side blocks you. Yeah, because exactly. you're right up I on the line, right? Up. Yeah, I think I don't think he was supposed to block me. To be honest with you, I really don't <laughs> no. think he was supposed to block me. Because the guy he didn't block was Shaquem Griffin. Exactly. And I Shaquem think, comes unblocked. Yep. I think the way – because the way we played it earlier in the year, they ran that type of play against somebody else, and he blocks out on the edge. Magnifico swings up and kick outs. He's supposed to kick me out mm-hmm. on the block. And there should be a whole a natural seam in that kind of uh, – in that whole process, there's a natural hole that they create bringing the extra player over. Right, because um, it, and, it looks yeah. like if that tight end doesn't block you, if he blocks Shaquem, then that frees up both Magnifico and Henderson to block you. Yep. And it looks like there's you, and I forget who else was right behind you. I think it was Jaquan, I believe. But right. if, if he blocked, the thing is, I wouldn't be, I was in the window because he blocked me. Right. I wasn't supposed to be in that window. If he would have blocked Shaquem, I, we call it green dog, say, because my I, we were in man coverage. So if he blocks Shaquem, I green dog and blitz because Shaquem was initially trying to blitz. So the second that he blocks out on Shaquem, if he would have done that, I would have blitzed as Shaquem would have blitzed and been the extra player because now we're blocking all of our rushers. I got to be the extra rusher on the quarterback. So I would have been out of the window, period. So so Shaquem yeah, – is- oh, go ahead, Murph. I'm sorry. That is nuts to watch again and to realize, like, because I think it was it was I think Dykes was the blocking tight end there. Yeah, Dykes and because, was, the one right. that was blo- blocking me. Yeah, and Dykes blo- and Dykes blocks you basically five yards down the field. <laughs> right. Because I, I really because didn't he, expect him to block me. I'm thinking, okay, no. he's gonna do the little fake block and then he's gonna throw the little like Tebow jump pass or something. So I'm playing. We, we're in man. I'm playing soft man because I'm like I don't have a responsibility in the run game. I'm just going to – if he blocks me, you can take me all the way to the end zone, but you're not about to run a route. Right. I'm going to make sure you don't run a route. No. So and- they'll be anxious in the run game. They just throw a dump pass right behind my head. I would have got – you know, I would have been the worst player in <laughs> history. You see <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the combination of Shaquem's pressure unblocked mm-hmm. and you being basically driven five yards back really into the for into the pass routes – Yep. It put you in, it put you in perfect position to make the play right. right in front of the window. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I wasn't supposed to make that play. <laughs> I promise you, I was not. That's not how it was driven up. They shouldn't have even whole play because he had called, their, their offensive coach called the perfect game. They whole game. Yeah. And of course, you know that one play is what I think. I was like, that was the only play that they really messed up on. He instead of when you see zero coverage, you don't want to throw it across the middle. You just throw one on one jump ball. Especially when Neville playing inside leverage, he's taking away the slant. He doesn't want you to get beat on the slant. Like that's that's the play. That's how we played our zero coverage. Right. You're playing inside leverage, no end cuts because that's the easier throw. Make him throw it to the pylon. Make him throw it to the sideline, to where he has no space. Yeah, and and it looks like for it, 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 slant. right, and it looked yeah he, they still ran the slant. It looked like Miller just kind of muscled his way inside. Yep. But the key mm-hmm. was Shaquem came the unblocked, pressure. right, and yep. And Her- Ferguson kind of hitches, he pumps when he sees Shaquem coming, and then he throws it off his back foot. You, by the way, are still getting – right. And you, by the way, are still getting pancakes six yards downfield. Yep. <laughs> I'm still getting blocked six yards down the field. I'm not – there's no way this guy's about to run around on me. So then – so, At that point, at that point, I'm like, okay, tendencies are out the door. Right. You know, they've already put him on the field, and they're 98% blocking. And they've thrown four or five pass plays. He's not about to catch a pass on me. I'm not letting him pass. I don't care if they run the ball for 10 yards. It's not going to be my fault that they freaking – he throws to catch a touchdown on me. Right. So so she, I was like, you can block me wherever you want. So, so Shaquan trips. He falls down. Mm-hmm. He's right next to you. That, and it yep. looks like there's a couple other places that Ferguson could have gone if he didn't throw the ball. But anyway, he throws the ball. Put us – here's what I want you to do. Put us inside your helmet – for that that split second of what you see with your own two eyes. So I'm looking at Dykes. I'm like, okay, it's going to be a – I don't care if it's a run play or if they run the ball. I'm looking at him the whole time. I'm going to grab on his jersey until I feel like the play's over. It's only holding if you get caught, right? <laughs> it's only holding if you get caught. So I'm grabbing on the inside of his jersey. And he's driving me, driving me, driving me. I'm like, okay, the play's got to be done. I don't know what they're doing back there. This play's got to be done now. So I peek my head. I'm like, okay, what's going on? 
because he's still blocking me. He kind of stops at the end because he's like, again, he's thinking the play should be done as well. I don't know what they're, what's taking so long. So he kind of stopped blocking me. So I'm just sitting there. And I see uh, Ferguson falling backwards, it seems. So he just can get the ball away and not take the hit from Shaquem. And the ball is just floating in there. I promise you, that ball never took so long to get in my hands <laughs> in my life. I was like, that ball was coming at me in slow motion. And I just jumped and caught it. And then I started running. I'm like, oh, gosh, I got the ball. Then I'm like, wait a minute. I just told everybody if we get an interception the ball. <laughs> so then I fall on the ground. I literally just fall on the ground. It was not graceful. I just plopped on the ground. I made sure that I didn't fumble. But I just plopped and gave myself up. And after that, I mean, after that was, I still didn't hear any screaming. Here's second down and goal from the nine. Need it all. Need a touchdown to keep the game going. Ferguson, pressure, thrown, intercepted! It's intercepted, that's your ball game! Trey Neal on the pick! I just remember I was excited and I looked at Kyle and he came over there and hugged him. And then all of a sudden, I was suffocating on the bottom of a football. <laughs> you look like you—you you look like you kind of got like a miniature like Deion Sanders high step going for a second, right? Oh my goodness! I was so—I've never been that excited for a football game in my life. I was just excited that it was over. I didn't care who made the play. I didn't care who got it. I was just like, this game is over. Finally, we can enjoy this. You know, enjoy this and be done with it. But I was so excited, man! It was ridiculous. Mm. I, 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 it was it was such a moment like this the, probably I don't know if when Mike Hughes returned that kick the week before if that was the loudest that stadium has ever been but this had to have been, if this wasn't tied with that it had to have been a close second all of a sudden everyone's jumping on you what was the feeling like yeah. were you I, I know that you said that you were super excited about it obviously but then it, at, at some point was there like a was there also like the sort of relief that oh my god we this game's over and we finally did it yeah, that was, uh, you know, after we kind of, you know, we had the hats and they started bringing the podium out, uh, we all started getting our shirts and stuff. It was just like, oh, thank goodness, you know. Really, it was thank goodness we have a break before the bowl game. We didn't care what bowl game it was. We were just like, thank goodness uh, we have a break to just let our body get back healed. Just because we had, I mean, we we're going at it. You're talking about 11 weeks mentally. That it's, it's, it's rough, man. It was It took a toll on a lot of people just, you know, coming in every single morning at six o'clock getting treatment getting taped taking care of this taking care of that coming in afternoon and at night to get your bodies you know just bodies right to practice let alone play a game on saturday so it was just you know it was draining you again but it was you know it was worth it all at that moment you know it became it was worth it at that point you know we get to play on new year's in front of everybody and again go prove some people wrong man We'll be back with more on the 2018 American Athletic Conference football championship game with Trey Neal after this. Now let's return to our conversation with former UCF safety Trey Neal here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. You know what I was really, what was really something we saw in the Netflix episode that happened is, is like, and, and of course we can go back to more of the game too in a second, but the incredible emotional high of winning that game in the way you guys did to mm -hmm. later that night, Scott yeah, Frost leaving. revealing to you and the team that he was leaving for Nebraska. It, mm -hmm. it, what was what was that like just going through that emotional roller coaster of uh, maybe the wildest day in UCF football history? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you're talking about winning the championship, going undefeated. Uh, I mean, that was, there was nothing like it. We got in that locker room, and I felt like we were partying for three hours straight. You know, that's how excited everybody was. I mean, we're talking to the O-line. We got O-linemen dancing, everybody dancing. And then, uh, I mean, nobody – we're on our phones, and the people are saying they got an alert. Nebraska, yep. but nobody's yep. even looking at this. We're we're on Snapchat, Instagram. We're putting stuff on live. You know, we're we're taking videos of this moment, stuff like that. Nobody's even. I mean, I know everybody's alerts pop up. You know, with ESPN, they scroll down real quick. Nobody's even looking at that. We're just like, get this off my phone. We're trying to record something. You know, stuff like that. So we don't even notice it. Nobody mentions it in there. We're all just excited, celebrating, and then uh, we go into. You know, they take some of the players for the uh, the press, the after game press conference. So we're going back there. I think it was me. McKenzie, Traquan, and Shaquem. So we're all going back there and we, we get to the podium and then, you know, they all ask us a few questions, blah, 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 how the game was, all that, you know, just stuff like that. And then 
I think somebody asked, like, how are you going to tell your team something? Yeah, that was Mike like, Bianchi. That mm -hmm. was Bianchi yeah. asking Frost, hey, have you talked to your team yet? And yeah, it was weird. We're first. Here, like, what are you About getting? what? <laughs> so it wasn't, but, you know, just that kind of press conference situation, uh, you know, so much. We kind of knew, you know, don't say anything crazy. We have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, you know, just kind of, you know, don't, don't, don't give away the surprise in it. I don't think I gave away any surprise, but I can tell you in my mind, I'm like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've always, you know, I always thought that, you know, when this kind of stuff, just, I thought that coaches change. I knew, you know, coaches leaving is nothing, you know, I don't get mad or anything for it, but I thought that was going to come out. I, I always felt like he was going to leave just because, you know, his alma mater came open. Of course, I'm like, you know, that'd be hard to turn down. I see. I, understand. I thought he was going to leave. I thought the time would have been different. Uh, I thought, you know, I thought we'd probably find out like a week later. Um, you know, it would have probably been, you know, nobody really been upset. I think that's probably the only problem that people I know uh, talking to teammates that they don't like about it. Not that they don't like Coach Frost. You know, that was one of the things like we couldn't even get a day to enjoy our championship. You know what I'm saying? That, that's that's yeah. kind of the only thing that you know, just talking to guys what? where it was just like, man, well, we can't get a day just to kind of it'd be about us. And, you know, just what we've done the whole year. Well, I think part of it, though, the problem was, uh, Trey and, and Murph, you could jump in on this. The Frost news kind of broke during the game. Right. I, you know, it's it, Yeah. You know, you, when you I know. went back and watched it, I was like, wow, I did not know that. And that's, I mean, that's crazy. I don't yeah. know how the timing was with all this release and all that. I don't, I don't know all of that, but man, that was, who. Well, you, you know how, it, you know how it went down. Um, and, and you saw it from the tape. Well, I was, I'm, I, unfortunately, I wasn't at the end. I was monitoring our Twitter feed for Black and Gold Banner at live from my house. And because uh -huh. Murph was at the game, we only got one seat. So, you know, my thing was like, I'm, I want Murph, you know, Murph covers the game because he's, he's, you know, Murph. And I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that he's there. He's a better reporter than me. I'm watching the game from TV, but, but everyone else was down on the field. Like we were saying, I think, I think they broke the news at the start of overtime. Start of the second overtime. It Start was of the Brett second McMurphy. overtime. Brett McMurphy had out. reported it, and Steve yeah. Levy, the play-by-play -play guy for ESPN, announced it on the air as the second overtime is about to begin. Back in Orlando getting ready for the second overtime period, and amongst reports, multiple reports, now saying that Scott Frost will be named the next head coach at the University of Nebraska, first reported by our own Brett McMurphy. <laughs> And that's coming well, out sure, right sure, now. Certainly didn't seem to have a decision made last night, and he's been coaching a game here for a while, so I'm not sure where that came from. Nebraska's not in his headset right now. So everyone who was yeah. watching on TV knew the news was happening. Unless you looked at your phone and you had a notification or something, no one else knew when the game was actually happening, even though it had already been reported. It was just this wild you know, tornado of news happening at once with everything going on. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this is crazy. We kind of I mean, we kind of knew that it like you that it was that it was a definite probability that he might yeah. leave. But we weren't sure when the news would break. All of a sudden it breaks then. And I'm like, I'm, I'm tweeting this out and then I'm sending this stuff out and I'm preparing right. that story. And meanwhile, well, the game's I'm going on and it's crazy. Yeah, and I want to get Murph's thoughts on this because you're down on the field, Murph, at this point. I, As I mentioned, I'm doing sideline, I'm doing stats and spotting at the radio broadcast, and the host that was hosting the, the, the in the studio for the radio broadcast mentioned it to Alan Bestwick and myself. I have a headset on. Hey, the reports are Scott Frost is going, going to Nebraska, and we're like looking at each other. It's like, wait a minute, he's coaching right now. <laughs> right. Um, when did he sign that contract? He's been here the whole time. <laughs> exactly. Murph. Murph, I want your thoughts. You're down on the field with the rest of the media. When did you, when did you guys notice that news? Did you know that that had just come out? Where were you guys at that point? Yeah, because everybody's on Twitter anyway. Yeah. So we all <laughs> see it. Like we all know. Uh, I, I think the striking thing for me about Scott was just the the deluge of emotions that he was feeling in the moment on national television once that game is over. He is so excited for his guys. Trey, I know after Scott did the handshake at midfield with uh, Mike Norvell, he was racing into the corner of the end oh, zone. Oh, yeah, he sprinted it over to us, man. And yeah. I think he found, he might he might have found you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was just nuts. And then, you know, he, he does the the on-the-field interview after the game, and he's asked about Nebraska, and he and all he says to that is, I'm going to go celebrate with my team. And yep. you can see you can see he's, he's, cry, he's been crying. 
he then it was he then got very choked up in that in that press conference setting with mm-hmm. you, McKenzie, Sha- uh, Shaquem, and Traquan. Uh, yeah. This this really racked him emotionally, um, and, and that's what struck out to me most is that yeah we think I think we all knew Scott was doing what was right for him and what the move that was it was just it was just a, a made fit for him to go to Nebraska yeah. Yeah. and yep. you know and all and all that. But you also understood how tough of a decision this also was for him, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I uh, after you know we had so we're all celebrating. We go back in the uh, after the little press conference there, you know, hanging out, taking pictures of the trophy, all of that, and we all, you know, for about another hour did that. Uh, probably thirty more minutes. We you know hang out with our family, talk, blah blah blah, and then we get a message saying, "Hey, team meeting at in the team meet. Everybody meet in the team meeting room at." whatever time it was and we're like we never have a meeting uh, <laughs> after a football game after you know after the game it's like hey make sure you make it back to your bed uh yeah. tonight you know that's just you know it's one of those things where we don't ever meet after a football game let alone after you know we have about two or three weeks off as far as you know having anything mandatory besides practice so we're like okay what's going on again i'm like i'm sitting here like i'm sitting on my phone how have we not seen on twitter Coach Frost is leaving. And I mean, people are still confused on the team. We're still confused. Like, how, what are we meeting about? We don't know what we're meeting about. Like, what is this about? So then we get in the, well, I showed up late to the meeting just because I was still changing clothes from the press conference. I think with me, McKenzie, and uh, Trey Kong, we're showing up kind of late. And we walk in there, and I mean, the dude is boo hooing, crying. I'm like, what did I just walk into? <laughs> and I'm, uh, so I get, and they, we kind of, and I mean, I, I see people crying. I'm thinking, who died? Like, what am I missing? I thought somebody had died or something, and would like something happened or something. I don't know. So, then we kind of just sit down, and you see some guys that are kind of upset and pissed off, and they're like, Coach Boston on Nebraska. I was like, well, I'm, well, how are we gonna go about this bowl game? Really, that's that was really what was on my mind, just because you know the seniors. I want them to go out, you know, with the best year that they can. Uh, so I would kind of figure out, you know, are we gonna have a temporary coach? Are we going to have a coach at all? Are we just going to have people taking care of us? Like, how is this all going to unfold? Are we going to have, you know, Coach Hype, that he, if he comes in, at the time I didn't know it was him, but are, is he going to coach us? You know, I didn't know how we were going to go about it. Uh, but after that meeting, you know, he's still crying. I went and talked to Coach Ross, and I was just like, man, look, you know, everybody, you know, whether this is college football or not, you're always going to do what's best for you in any, you know, business management or aspect of your life. Uh, so I was like, don't, you know, don't beat it up. And he was just saying, you know, he didn't really want to do it because he loved us so much, you know, just having that, you know, then fun, the enjoyment that he had with his group. He said he's never had so much fun. I was like, you know, that, of course, you know, of course I loved it. You know, it was fun. Everybody loved it. But, you know, he was just saying that there was other factors into it. And, I, you know, I won't get into all that, but it was just, uh, you know, it's a lot more factors than what people have led on. Uh, he And he was, he was, he was being a good guy uh, for what he did. For no, absolutely, for absolutely. Because there are so many factors. Because it's not like not not only did he play there, he yeah. grew up there. That is that is that yeah. is the team of his. Team. Tom yeah. Osborne, yeah. who is a legend, is his coaching idol. Regardless, it is his yeah, mentor. He's, I mean, they, you know, now he's working under Tom Osborne. Yep. Uh, it's 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 a perfect fit for him to come back yep. and be like you know the the product the prodigal son returns. Prodigal. Yep. And, and, I mean, and it's one of those things where I mean, we used to when we would have like meetings during camp, he will always bring up Tom Osborne, and you know, just us playing, you know, being you know college football obsessed when we were kids, we know who Tom Osborne was with Nebraska, you know, not mm-hmm. for fond reasons, you know, they're beating the U, you know, they're beating Miami in the championship stuff like <laughs> right. the teams that we like, but uh, <laughs> you know, we know of you know how great he was, so we knew you know how much affection he had for. You know, Coach Osborne and, you know, his alma mater. He loved it. I mean, and even when he tells the story about how he went to Stanford first and then he, you know, he hated that he went to Stanford instead of Nebraska when he had that opportunity. You know, it was just one of those things where you know that kind of situation. I tell people all the time, I'm like, you can't blame the guy. I say, what if you guys are in a situation like that one day and UCF wants y'all to come back on? And we're some, you know, former, pa- not hopefully, we're not just a former power, but like we're, you know, a powerhouse looking for a resurrection and, you know, and y'all are the ones that they call to come back i'm like you're not going to pass on the opportunity i don't care how much you love wherever you're at you're not going to pass to go revive your you know your alma mater you know it's that that's 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 a hard thing to pass especially if you're from there you know your favorite coach the coach that you admire is still around the facilities 
you know, he's like your your mentor, and you go save your, you know, go save your your alma mater. I said, I, that's a tough thing to pass. I said, you can be the mm-hmm. person that'll do. Give them a lot of props for that. But yeah. again, there were, I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot of things that went into it, which is why I'm sure you know it wore on him so much and just the emotional you know toll of that. Because again, he could have told us this whenever that deal got done, he could have released it at that time. But again, I know he felt like he would lose that the locker room and the respect, and he had too much appreciation and respect for us to even have that kind of thing. But you know, we there was a lot of afterwards. You know, those bowl practices, man, they were those were probably some of the roughest bowl practices we were a part of, just because of you know tension wise, what was hmm. going on and you know, stuff you, like that. But, you know, you know, I I had heard from another player that. Uh, in in one of the bowl practices, I think it was like one of the first or second bowl practices that was you know after the Memphis game before Auburn, that you guys had a bad practice, yeah. And and Frost kind of came back and I want to I want to see if you can corroborate this. Frost came back and after the practice, he laid into you guys and he said, "Listen, it, yep. so, something to the effect of like, listen, I'm not flying back and forth between back. here yep. and Lincoln just to yep. see you guys lose." Right, mm-hmm. I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I want to go out the right way with you guys, and I expect that effort from you. Is that true? That is a hundred percent true. I mean, and the bad practice. To be honest, we made it bad on practice on purpose. It wasn't. It was, and I think that was kind of again looking back. That was very immature of us. But, but I you think guys we were, were pissed. To, so we were supposed to be out. So early on we were supposed to have it was a padded practice i think it was probably a week at we had a week break and then we were coming back just kind of you know feel you know get back into that kind of motion of things um we were supposed to have just shoulder pads on we, were, we weren't going to really hit but you know just to feel shoulder pads on you know the lineman our hand placement stuff like that we can kind of get our hands and get back in the rhythm and i remember we were in the locker room i mean we're people are still fuming again i'm just like look whatever mm. we vote on that's what we're gonna do because we had already people had already been saying we're not gonna we're not going out on shoulder pads. This is messed up how they got us pr- practicing with shoulder pads. Again, it was very immature, but we were just like, look, if we're gonna do this, we're all gonna do it. There's not gonna be one person who come down shoulder pads like, oh my bad. I said we're gonna be a team about it, and we'll face whatever consequences we have to face afterwards. If they run us to death, so be it. They're gonna run us to death, but we're gonna do this as a team. There's not gonna be it. So we all came in the locker room. And we were like, we're going to go out with just helmets. And again, they probably, we walked out there. I've never seen their eyes bigger. They were like, what are they doing? So they come up to, you know, they call up Shaquem first. He's the leader. They're like, why aren't you guys in shoulder pads? They're like, coach, we voted as a team that and in, in, uh, in helmets because we're, our bodies are still hurting. Again, at the time, that's not why we were just pissed off kids. But um, mm. at the time, you know, where our bodies were hurting, blah, blah, blah. But Again, Coach Frost had no problem with that, which I give him props. He's like, okay, no practice. But when we made practice bad and we practiced terrible, people were like, okay, he's going to be mad. He's just going to be, you know, upset. But, like, kind of a hurt upset. But, I mean, he laid into it. He was telling us, you know, y'all don't want me here. I I will go back and just go full on the head with, you know, Nebraska. Blah, blah, blah. He said, but I did not, like what you said, he said, I did not want to go out like that. I wanted to finish what we started. We've always talked about finish what we started and doing it the right way. I mean, he was out, again, at the time it was Adrian, the uh, quarterback in Nebraska. He was out in California, flying to Mm -hmm. California, flying back to Lincoln, flying out to visit him and visit all these recruits while also coming back to help us practice every other day. So, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, look, man, the dude's going above and beyond. And we had to meet about it again afterwards. Like We're like, the dude's going above and beyond, you know, just so that we can have a coach in the bowl game. So I think, I and again, we kind of, you know, we apologized to him and said, look, you know, we're hurt upset blah 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 hashed it out and then we we're just like look we're gonna we apologize but you know we're gonna we respect you for you know doing all of that and traveling all that i mean the dude was tired just from you know traveling so much but uh you know so i think we got a lot of that respect for it and that kind of shifted the uh how we started practicing more but i i'm i'm, a, I'm very glad that we got that out of the gate right now and it didn't linger into the bowl game because it could have been I mean, if we right. rolled on that stuff, you could have seen. I mean, that's one of those things where if we're losing by 20 points to Auburn in the game, we could end up losing by 50, you know. And that, you know, looking back now, that could have changed the whole trajectory of, you know, the whole school. Just looking at, you know, just the brand that we built and everything from that. Uh, 
you know, and I, again, that's just another little thing that we had to hash out, you know, just as, as men, you know, and I think that we, we learned a lot from that just hashing out moment. And I know that, you know, it carried over into the next year and it's now, you know, those guys are, those are some very mature guys handling stuff. And again, a lot of those guys are seniors now that are going to be seniors this upcoming year. You know, they were freshmen, they were babies when all this was going on. So now just being able to, you know, them being there now, they can kind of get through all, they can get through anything. I tell them, I'm like, you guys have seen, you know, the greatest peaks of this place. And, you know, you guys know how to handle all of the craziness. So go out and handle it when I talk to them whenever. Yeah. And now, and, and, and I guess, you know, looking back at, of course, I mean, need we say more about, you know, the, the peach bowl against Auburn and maybe, and uh, we'd love to have you on some, some other point to talk about that game too. But um, after the 2017 season, you guys complete the undefeated, uh, undefeated champ, uh, undefeated season, conference champs, mm-hmm. national champs, uh, everything that, everything that went on. And um, you elected to finish your college football career with Scott Frost and that staff mm-hmm. at Nebraska. Um, yep. Why Why did you decide to go out there uh, to finish out? So initially I wanted to, because there's not a dental program in uh, at UCF. And when mm-hmm. I first committed to UCF back in 2014, I remember talking to O'Leary. He laid out, it was a one-on-one meeting with him. I think right before we left after our visit, I was the last one. So I'm like, why am I the last one? I was you know, one of the first people here. And I think I was in his office for about an hour, hour and a half. And then he took me to go see some of the medical personally he took me to go see the uh, med school and i went to with them for about an hour hour and a half just to uh because they laid out they're like we don't have a dental school now this is our plan for a dental school it was supposed to be around 2017 they said that they were gonna have like a med school and start dental school like their own dental school and i mean it was one of those things that it never came kind of came to fruition i guess i mean for a variety of reasons which understandable but uh so I was like, okay, you know, I just had seen the draft. I've just, you know, seen some of the guys make it from our team that I thought were really good, and they made it. And then there's some guys where I'm like, oh, why aren't they in the NFL? You know, why aren't they getting their shot, that fair shot for them? Uh, so I think it was one of those things where, you know, I've always had dreams. I always, you know, I just, I'm like, I want to play in the NFL, you know. And so I've always – but I always knew just from growing up that I needed a great fallback option, you know. Not to say I'm not going to go full out with this NFL thing, but I don't want to go full out and then land on nothing and have nothing for it. So I talked to my parents about it a lot, um, a lot. And I was just like, I need to find somewhere where there's a dental school. Initially, I didn't, I, I didn't even think of Nebraska. I was thinking more UNC. I was thinking more um, thinking more like some places in Georgia. Um, sometimes, I mean, there were some thoughts where I was just like, you know, it was a great run. Uh, I need to start focusing on dental um, and just, you know, start focusing, going straight into that. And I just, you know, not even to play my last season. So that those were kind of the things that I kind of dealt with. But then I had came across, I went up and looked at more dental schools and I saw Nebraska had a dental school. So I'm like, okay, well, I can go for maybe a year, you know, try out my UCF stuff, get a master's and stay in. And then if it doesn't work out in the NFL, I can always go back into dentistry Mm -hmm. and I already have that kind of foot in the door, you know? So, and I said, of course I can go play and help them out. And, you know, I was presented the opportunity. I was like, you know, I don't think I can pass it up for that reason. Because again, I get to finish my, my last year. I can go try for the NFL. If I make it, I make it. If not, I don't, but I can still have my foot in the door to get in. Versus, you know, I'm, I would be applying as, you know, okay, this play, guy, he plays for football and he already kind of in the, our master program. It'll be an easy transition for him versus a kid from Georgia who's just a random kid from Georgia, no ties to anything applying for a program. And, you know, a lot of the stuff is just, you know, being able to get that foot in the door early that can kind of push you over other applicants. And I, that's just how, you know, the medical field is. I mean, now – you know, the doctors and all the, uh, you know, anesthesia and PA. Most of it, hearing their stories about how they got in, I think I've probably talked to 30 or 35 of them. I think only one or two of them are just like, yeah, this has been great. I don't really know anybody. Everybody else is just, you know, I had this letter of recommendation from this doctor who went here, or I knew the person that did this, did this here. So, you know, that's really, it's, it sucks that, you know, you know, we don't take just the, you know, just the value of what people do as performance to see if they're worthy 
it's a, more of a he say she say and it's about who you know and what you know i've been told that my whole life not about what you know sadly my dad always told me it's not about what you know it's about who you know so you know i had to you know kind of figure that out and again i don't regret that decision at all um you know, I still talk to the guys at UCF. I still, you know, talk to some of the coaches there. There's no bad blood or anything there. I went in last year, and I was tapping it up with some of the coaches and all that. And, you know, it's, it's it's one of those things where, you know, it takes two mature sides to move past that. I know I got a lot of backlash on Twitter, though. Trust me about that. I got a lot of it <laughs> about that. I mean, stuff, but. I love that perspective because, again, when, when fans look at, you know, oh, such, such and such player is transferring from one school to another, yeah. and if he's a – if he's a football player, we look at it solely through a football lens. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and it, it clouds everything because then people are wondering, why is he going to Nebraska? Why is he leaving an undefeated team? Uh, exactly. Did he have, did he have a problem with where he was playing? Was he not playing enough or something? Did yeah. he have a, a falling out? Like, no. Does he not like the coach or any of that yeah, kind of crap? Like Just that. trade, Neil. I would hate him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, it's, yeah, it's that, about that stuff is just absurd, man. It's just, and again, it's just people create those things because they don't really know. And I used to be like, why don't y'all just ask me? I'll tell you what you like. I'll tell you what's going on. It's not, it's not hard. But I, again, I don't think people. I think they kind of they don't want to hear that. Sometimes they just want to kind of go off of, you know, whatever they want to create in their head. Which that's fine. It doesn't it doesn't really bother me. But mm-hmm. um, you know, when people ask, like, I mean, I talk to my I talk to my teammates about it. I talked to the coaches there about it. I talked to my parents. I talked to everybody about it. You know, just what. And again, a lot of them said, you know, just do what you feel is right. They didn't know I was going to Nebraska. Nobody, I didn't even know I was going to Nebraska at first. You know, <laughs> where that's just this pre- what presented to me at the time. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't initially say, oh, I'm leaving. So I go, Nebraska. I'm like, no, I need to figure it out. Because what if I would have torn my ACL at UCF my senior year? Right. And then I don't have a digital score to get. Nobody cares about that. Nobody's thinking about that. They're just like, oh, well, it sucks you tore your ACL. Good luck in the real world. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's good to pin it then, but, you know, now I'm just like, you know, I made the right. Hmm. I mean, I had the dental program the other day. It was like, you, you ever thinking about going? Now I don't know if I'm really dental just because I've lived in such a, again, playing football is a lot different than, you know, working in a dentist's office, which is why, uh, you know, I'm – I'm in the operating room because I feel like I'm I get that same excitement playing football in the operating room uh you know just seeing surgeries and seeing traumas come in I mean you're talking about car wrecks uh shootings things like that you know just seeing all that stuff I get that kind of excitement not excitement sorry to say but that that adrenaline rush of trying to you know help right. people that that need help you know help people that are fighting for their lives and help people like that that I get that kind of excitement in those moments and again there's only a certain amount of people that can deal with traumas. I've seen people that, that faint, some doctors that faint, and they, they kind of, you know, that's a lot of pressure to be under. And, again, it's, I tell people, I'm like, this reminds me so much of football. It's ridiculous, just the kind of pressure you go into. So I embrace it, man. I embrace it. I enjoy it. But, uh, yeah, man, I, you know, UC, I'm, UCF made me, you know, they helped grow me into the man I was. I've never been – outside of probably 30 minutes from Georgia and my home. And you're talking about an 18-year-old kid going eight hours away from home, you know, and just growing up. You know, I had to do everything, you know. If I needed something, I couldn't just call my mom and be like, hey, can you fix this for me? Or my dad and be like, hey, can you fix this for me? No, I had to, you know, rely on my teammates and rely on my coaches down here. And, you know, just some stuff I had to deal with by myself. So you know, I'm indebted to the school for that just because, you know, they helped make me who I am today. Yeah, oh, I know we we miss you. We we would have loved to have seen you on senior day, but you made the right you made the right call, man. So we'll, let let's I guess finish up with this. Unless uh, Brian and Eric have anything else, what's the next step for you? You're working at Northeast Georgia. Where do you see yeah. yourself? What do you see yourself doing over the next five to ten, five to ten years? Um, I want to go into so you know just being in the in the operating room. I'm thinking about going to be an AA, which is uh, an anesthesiologist assistant. Um, kind of deal with the medicine part. You kind of monitor vitals. That, I, that's what I've been really shadowing the most while I've been up here. Um, trying to get into AA school and, you know, be at AA for a year and a half, two years, and then, you know, go be in work in the, uh, work in the operating room. I want to work at, you know, a level one trauma center, just where, you know, that a level one means that there's just a whole bunch of, you know, like car wreck surgery, you got to manage uh, gunshot, stuff like that. Just the, you know, the traumatic thing where, you know, it's life or death kind of on the line kind of thing. Yeah. Just because 
I can get that, you know, the reasoning. I feel the reasoning behind doing it. I feel like I'm helping people. I feel like, you know, the pressure, that pressure, I embrace it. And I feel like, you know, they could me in that kind of situation if I'm able to help. Uh, that's that's my plan. I definitely want to get back to Florida. Man, I, I miss it. I miss Orlando. You know, Orlando's great because you can go – everything is drivable range in the whole state. You know, you can drive to Daytona Beach. You can drive to Jacksonville. You can drive to Miami. You can drive to Tampa. You know, I, I miss, you know, being able to be in Florida and just go see different so much different things. And I'm tired of the, the gloominess of the clouds here. It's not really like I'm, – I'm ready to see some palm trees and some sun and some beach and that. And some good high school football too. I know that – North Georgia is not the same as South Georgia, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> North Georgia's got some real high school football, man. I'm not gonna lie, they got some. South Georgia's pretty good. Uh, they, they're bigger. They're they're bigger. They don't have like one school or two schools a county. Whereas North Georgia, we have, you know, a lot more. Yeah, 15, sometimes 15, 16 schools in one county. Yeah. Uh, it's... that's the plan, though. Go go to school, BAA, and you know, try to get my way back to Florida so I can come up to UCF games more, man. Murph, Brian, you guys got anything else? Well, I just want to thank Trey. I mean, it, it, we wanted this to be in depth, and I think uh, this was more in depth than even I could have imagined. That. <laughs> I'll say, I just, uh, I, I, I appreciate Trey's not only Trey's insight, but his memory and his recall, and that's a valuable thing to have with these sort of things. And uh, you know, it's it's one thing. You know, I don't think you can go to every player, and every player will have that that sort of play by play recall of things that happen. So. Uh, the, Trey, you were the perfect guy to have on here, and I appreciate the time you've given no us. Problem. Yeah, no problem. Hey, man. Anytime. No, I, anything. Hey, I, hey, I've told Trey, and per, like I've told him, hey man, you should do color commentary. All right, like if, <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact he's actually doing important stuff, if it wasn't for that he's doing actual important stuff, I would say, hey, you should be joining us on the staff here <laughs> and analyzing games for us during the season. But you guys have hey, more man, important I, things. I thought about it. Don't worry. I thought about it. I thought about it. That's good. Hey. Hey, let's do it. I thought, I mean, I've, I've tried to, you know, with being like the A, you know, doing my AA, you can kind of pick your hours. I've thought about, you know, doing some commentary on some games. Or I've thought about coaching maybe high school, you know, helping out high school coaches, stuff like that. I mean, I love football, man. I love sports regardless. I can talk about basketball. I can talk about anything, you know. Doc, this Jordan documentary, man, my man, goodness. I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you yeah. what, man. If you ever want, if you ever want to come back on and talk a, talk a little football with us, you the door is always open, Trey. Um, real quick, uh, where can where can all those uh, where can all those UCF fans uh, who uh, who said nasty things to you on Twitter? Where can they hit you up to apologize? Hey, man. You know you can hit me up wherever you want. If you want to call me, text me, whatever. It doesn't matter. Hopefully it's not bad stuff, but you know, again, I I understood at the time, but you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those things. Bad breakup again. The same people that were, you know, complaining about Coach Frost were, you know, they were complaining about me too. But you know, with time, time heals all wounds. So I never was really mad at those people. I just kind of you know ignored it. I'm just like, wow, you know, this place is. I didn't know Twitter was so ruthless. Really, uh, you know, I've seen yeah. it, but I didn't think it was that ruthless. So you know, it's one of those things where you know now I can just you know look back and laugh. You know, I went to the fans like, hey man, how you doing? How was blah blah? You know, guys that know and all that stuff. You know, I've seen they come up and talk and they you know they get it now. You know, yeah. You know, once we, time here, you know, time, let some time pass and everything's all right. We always got it. We still miss you down here, and uh, like you said, hopefully listen, we'll hey, have listen, you. By the way, too, man. and you you made a play that's going to be remembered forever. It's what it's the most meaningful. One of the most biggest interceptions in the history of the program if not the biggest uh and that was your last play at home at, at, the, yeah. at the bounce yeah. house yeah. I mean, what a way pretty, to go out i mean pretty good I remember I, day. <laughs> pretty darn yeah i mean yeah. that was amazing <laughs> now and i'll never forget it was me uh brandon helwig of ucf sports.com and i don't remember yeah, murph right. if you were with us in the locker room or if you were chasing the frost story at that point right after the game uh but i remember running into you trey you still were in your yep. jersey and you were holding the football yeah, and I think I, re- I remember I asked you like, "Do you get to keep the football?" And you were like, "I'm not sure, but I'm gonna try." <laughs> what happened to the oh, football? Yeah, yeah I, I really wasn't sure about how, uh, you know, how that went about. Is like the team. So I remember like I didn't know if like some of the Memphis people were gonna be like, "Hey, we need our footballs back" or whatever. I don't know if you know stuff like that, but I still got it, man. But you know, as time is gone, you know, I've kind of you know, you know, you just kind of grow, not apart from it, but you realize there's a lot more. Uh, you know, there's a lot more things important in life. I know that, um, you know, that that was, play was important to me, but that was never 
what I remember about that season, it was, you know, the guys. I still talk to those guys. I still hang out. We still play video games, stuff like that. You know, I think that was the – those are the memories I cherish the most. I mean, the football is a great individual memory, but, I mean, just some of the things we did during the year was the most – that was the most fun that I've ever been in my life with any sport. And any, uh, I mean, just the guys, the personalities, the guys we were doing. You know, when we hang out, we used to go bowling every Thursday. It was a dollar bowl, and we would all go bowling. And, you know, things like that is what made it fun. You know, it, that's what made the season enjoyable. And, you know, I think that's what I take away from most of it. I mean, I've thought about, you know, eventually, you know, I mean, the football had – that football has more – it holds more valuable to the school. So I've thought about, you know, saying, hey, here's the, the ball. If you guys want to do whatever you want to do with it, you know, I still got it. Here's the ball. You guys can keep it. Because, I mean, eventually, you know, I might die one – I'm going to die one day. But, you know, I don't want that football to get lost. You know, that's the piece of history So for other people. So I thought about, you know, here, my great-great-great-great-grandkids are going to be like, what's this? Oh, I don't know. Just go <laughs> outside and kick it out. But, you know, UCF will always have that that memory of that. So I've always thought about, you know, giving that ball back. My mom a little bit longer. <laughs> well, Trey, thanks again. <laughs> we uh, we appreciate the incredible depth that you gave us and looking back at this great game. I know we're going to, we got to have you on again at some point to talk yeah. about things and um, Let me know. will do just continue to stay safe up there in Georgia. And thank you for everything that you're doing because uh, I know there's a lot, a lot of people counting on you many more so than ever counted on you to do anything on the football field. There's a lot of people counting yeah. on you back home now. Yes, sir. I appreciate it, man. I thank you guys for calling me and having me on, man. Go Knights. All right. Uh, that'll do it for our special rewind edition of the Black and Gold Banner at Podcast with Trey Neal. Thanks again to Trey. For Eric and Brian, I'm Jeff. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you again later.